Good afternoon from Cairo. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the second glaucoma webinar by the Glaucoma Service of Kasralaini School of Medicine. The title of the webinar is Primary Open Angle Glaucoma Guidelines and a Case-Based Approach. The glaucoma team today will present all the topics related to the primary open angle glaucoma, and I'm really proud and honored to work with such team. Professor Dr. Zainab Senabari, Dr. Rasha Munir, Dr. Yasmin Sayed, Dr. Riham Sami, Dr. Heba Magdi, Dr. Iman Magdi, uh, Dr. Fairuz Abu Azain, and Dr. Mona Ahmed, and myself, Ahmed Mustafa Abdurrahman. Today we have two sessions. The first session is the evidence-based in relation to the primary open angle glaucoma, and I have the pleasure to moderate this session. And the next session will be about the application of the guidelines through a case-based approach, and my dear colleague, Dr. Rasha Munir, will moderate this session. To have a queue and a uh, button where you can type your question and we will answer uh, the questions as much as we can. Now, without further ado, we will move to the program. The first talk is by Dr. Zainab El Sanabari, and Dr. Zainab El Sanabari is a professor of ophthalmology in Cairo University. She is the general manager of Al Bustan Diagnostic Eye Center. She is a real authority in the field of investigative ophthalmology. She is my mentor and professor. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce her with her talk, Optimal Benefits of Investigations. Dr. Azina, please. Thank you, Ahmed, for the, your nice introduction. Um, uh, good afternoon, my colleagues. Uh, the objective of my talk is to highlight the optimal use of investigative tools that can be uh, used uh, to diagnose early glaucoma uh, and uh, help in follow-up and management of open-angle glaucoma. If we look at this scheme, we find that we have a general scheme when we diagnose open-angle glaucoma by gonioscopy. Uh, either we have a raised IOP, uh, and we should always measure the central corneal thickness in all conditions. So we have either definite primary open angle glaucoma by desk changes and visual field, or we have a normal visual field, but definite disc changes that we call pre-perimetric, or normal optic disc and visual field that we call ocular hypertension. If we have a normal intraocular pressure, but we have disc changes and visual field defects, we may have a borderline IOP that will also diagnose primary open angle glaucoma, or a low IOP that may diagnose normal tensive glaucoma. Now we'll come how to use the investigations in each step of them. And the first one is to rule out a secondary glaucoma. Rule out a secondary glaucoma after uh, uh, using gonioscopy, we have to use a UBM or anterior segment OCT. The UBM has a higher uh, specification to examine the angle recess and to diagnose a condition like pigment dispersion syndrome or a case like an angle recession with the uh, scleral spur inserted or detected very uh, anterior to the angle recess. For uh, the UBM also, it is very useful uh, to, for the post-operative examination of cases, especially cases that we want to evaluate the filtration, like uh, non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, uh, showing uh, some sort of a blab and the lake uh, of uh, filtration. And uh, yesterday, I knew that Dr. Ahmed Abdurrahman and his colleagues, Dr. Hala Shouek, and Dr. Regina and Reham, uh, has published a very nice uh, publication uh, naming the shape of uh, this uh, finding in UBM as dolphin head sign. As we see, it's very interesting and looking like a dolphin. Uh, also for the anterior segment OCT, we may uh, use it mainly to uh, examine the filtration and the non-filtering blab, but for the angle recess, 
it may be difficult to get good information as UVM by the anterior segment OCT, as the angle recess is usually obscured by the limits. Uh, for the central corneal thickness, we can measure it by ultrasonic tachymetry, we can measure it by a uh, anterior segment OCT, and also we can measure it by the chamfer uh, imaging, giving us the advantage of having certain equations to correct the, uh, the measured IOP and also to detect the depths of the AC in different areas. Then if you go again for the scheme, we'll find that one of the most important things to be examined first are the disc changes and then the visual field. For the disc changes, we should do always colored food for the up disc registration and follow up and better analysis to watch for the inferior uh, notching or splinter hemorrhage that indicate uh, uh, inadequate control of IOP or optic atrophy like this case. And then we'll come to the visual field. In the visual field, I may need the field to diagnose early changes, or I may need it for follow-up, especially for advanced cases. If I need, if we'll do field for early diagnosis, usually the standard automated perimetry uh, is the uh, standard uh, uh, perimeter used. And then we may resort to the other stimuli that give me um, uh, early diagnosis like the pulsar and flicker or the frequency doubling. The frequency doubling uses uh, the uh, idea for motion and contrast, and it is uh, now known as matrix field, and it is interpreted like the standard automated perimetry with the same probabilities and it is very useful for screening, as it is very rapid. For the follow-up, we may use the standard automated perimetry 10-2, or we can increase the size of the stimulus, may resort to automated or semi-automated kinetic perimetry, and we may use cluster analysis. How can we stage the field changes? We can stage the field changes using two systems either the Hodder parish anderson staging system, which depends on the mean deviation and depends on the glaucoma hemifield test, and also the number of points detected in each quadrant and their impact on fixation. As we'll see, we have the early, the moderate, and the severe as it encroaches on fixation. Or the other type of staging is the field damage line score, which depends on the uh, first detection of the nasal step and then the number of quadrants uh, affected, whether it is one, two, or three, or the advanced having a small central island of vision, as we see here, mild to moderate or marked or far advanced. Uh, for the early diagnosis, we should analyze certain ganglion cells and mainly the M cells, uh, that will uh, depend on motion and the flicker. For the uh, K-cells, uh, uh, in the history we were using the swap, but the swap uh, didn't stand the time because it takes long time, it has variable um, results, and it changes with the cataract and with macular degeneration. The stimulus that now is available that uses the uh, contrast sensitivity and the uh, frequency affection is the pulsar stimulus, as we see the stimulus in the image. And for the follow-up for advanced cases, we can use uh, the uh, kinetic and semi-kinetic automated perimetry that will give us a very good estimation for the uh, true uh, field seen by the patient. Also, the cluster analysis. The cluster analysis depends on what we call uh, grouping or clustering the uh, locations uh, following the nerve bundle uh, distribution and giving marks for the depth of the defect. And uh, this can be used also in research because all the staging for research also depend on the cluster of points. For the follow-up, we should do two things, either the trend analysis that will show the rate of progression along the year, and uh, it can give us a slope for the mean defect, 
and uh, give us significance for this the sloping uh, fraction. Or we may use event analysis if we don't have enough data for a trend analysis, means more than three fields. Uh, we can uh, judge each area by these marks, a uh, triangle and inch triangle. Uh, that means this defect appears for the first time or uh, a split triangle for the second time or a totally black triangle, which means that this defect appeared for three times, which is more significant. Again, if we go for the scheme, we will go to the OCG. The OCG is very important for diagnosis. Uh, by measuring the optic nerve head parameters, looking for the CG ratio, the rim area, and the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in the peripapillary area in each sector, average, inferior, and superior, and the ganglion cell complex for focal affection, and also for the uh, average, superior, and inferior. Also, again, the follow-up is very important. We should always know that it should the follow-up for the OCG or the field, it's better to be done with the same instrument as the normative data differ from instrument to the other. We can uh, analyze for event analysis, seeing that this area was in the green zone and then it become in the yellow and the numbers are diminishing. And then, uh, or with the trend analysis, looking for a curve, for the uh, average retinal nerve fiber layer, the superior and the inferior. Also, for example, in ZEISS, we may get also some sort of a significance for the rate of change, whether it is highly significant or not. The ganglion cell complex gives us also the trend analysis for the average superior and inferior and an event analysis for the increased or increasing focal affection. However, we should always be careful that we can't use OCG for follow-up in advanced cases, uh, as the quality of the scan and the severity of glaucoma will influence the accuracy. And also we have this floor effect. The floor effect doesn't mean a zero uh, thickness because we have the effect of the connective tissue cells and the molar cells, but it will uh, not show any uh, significant change after that, uh, as we see also in the ganglion cell complex. Also in high myopes, they may give us a low signal, wrong measurements, because of the peripapillary atrophy and the tilted optic disc, as we see in this photo. We have here very high myopia and we see the posterior staphyloma. And, but however, we have uh, less affection of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, which is not sure. And in this area with good measurement, we'll have a good uh, or a more significant affection of retinal nerve fiber. So for monitoring glaucoma progression by OCT, we should know that the most clinically relevant retinal nerve fiber layer are the average and the inferior quadrant. And when there is a decrease in the average by five micron, we should uh, take it into consideration and consider it uh, for a, a significant decrease. And for each sector from seven to eight microns decrease. So the decrease in the average should be taken with a less amount as it is a global affection. The secondly, the retinal nerve thinning may be valuable for early diagnosis. However, if it remains in the green area, this doesn't mean that we have progressive thinning. So we should look at the numbers because we have a glaucoma that is called as green disease. I have all the curve in the green area, but it is decreasing. Asymmetric thinning of the retinal nerve fibers also between both eyes will give an alert, an alarm, with a difference greater than nine micron in the average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And we should always notice this for glaucoma, the asymmetry will give us an alarm. On the other hand, for myopia, it may have abnormal thinning, but there is no progression and there is no glaucoma, what we call red disease. For the ganglion cell complex thickenings, a change in the average of four microns will give us an alert. 
Then, if you go again for the scheme, we'll go to the normal tensor glucose. And we found that we may need to uh, do a diurnal variation test or central corneal thickness, also visual field and OCT to rule out other causes before diagnosing normal tension glucose. Like this, for example, we have the OCT that will diagnose papilledema, and we have the fields that will diagnose a neurological affection. For the OCG and geography of peripapillary plexus and macular area, the OCG study provided evidence of vascular changes in the optic nerve head in the peripapillary and macular region in comparison to glaucoma suspects and normal. And it can detect also longitudinal reduction, which means it's important for follow-up. However, we can't uh, know now if this reduced microcirculation is due to the glaucoma or due to neuronal uh, or due to the less uh, circulation required for damaged tissue. And this, we have this picture for the peripatellary affection. We may have areas here of ischemia and we'll compare the vessel density to the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness we should always, this is mainly now for research, uh, and we can use it maybe for advanced glaucoma and normal tension cases. So, the final test. We should measure always the central corneal thickness to determine the risk factor and adjust the IUP. In order to confirm a primary open angle glaucoma, if we have a suspicion that we have another secondary cause, we may use UPM. We may use anterior segment OCG and UVM for the diagnosis of a cause of a failed surgery. The optic disc photography is essential for better analysis and follow-up. We use visual field for early diagnosis and follow-up in advanced cases. The visual field is very important for follow-up in advanced cases and also to rule out other associated, maybe associated causes or maybe the main cause for visual defects. The OCG will be used for early diagnosis also, but not used in advanced cases and very high myopia. And it may be used also to rule out other causes of defective vision like optic disc edema or drusia. Uh, the OCGA may be now used for follow-up and may be used more in advanced cases. The follow-up schedule should be followed with the same test and method to facilitate estimation of progression. We'll do the baseline, then repeat within three months after the baseline, then up to four times in the first two years in case of high risk of progression, and then repeat it annually for ocular hypertensives. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Ajanab, thank you very much. That's really a great uh, talk, summarizing the main findings of the investigations in primary open angle glaucoma. Mm -hmm. uh, so ju just a question, Dr. Ajanab, if the patient is having um, a, a suspected to be glaucoma and then all the investigations are normal and the pressure is like 24, 25, yes. then, then when do you repeat the investigations actually? We can, uh, we can have the baseline and then repeat after three months. And then if we have all are the same, we can uh, increase the time for the follow-up to six months up to one year. But we, are following uh, the, but we are following the patient, I mean the investigations, for yes, the field yes. and for the OCG, but not cutting our relation with the patient. Yes, and the gangrene cells, um, the, uh, and the significance of gangrene cells versus the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer. So that um, th there is a bit uh, debate about that. Is, should we depend on the change in the gangrene cells? Or... I, I think we should use both because sometimes we may have some sort of atrophy in the uh, macular area due to age-related uh, uh, disease, for example. So we should always depend on both and look at both. Yes, uh, interesting. Then, um, 
Uh, the panel, do you have questions to uh, Dr. Zinab? Okay, then for the uh, interest of time, and we'll back to you again, Dr. Zinab, uh, okay. later. And then uh, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. And then may I invite my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Yasmin Said. Uh, Dr. Yasmin will talk about uh, setting a target intraocular pressure. As you know, uh, Yasmin is a very active and big star in the field of glaucoma. So Yasmin, pleasure to have you with us today. Um, please. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, Dr. Ahmed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for always uh, keeping us active in these uh, uh, events. Uh, so my talk is on setting a target for glaucoma patients. And um, in order to set the target, we need to know, sorry, uh, we need to know what our goals are uh, in dealing with a glaucoma patient. So what you want for your glaucoma patient is to maintain the best possible functional vision uh, throughout the patient's lifetime and with the best quality of life. And in order to achieve that, the only modifiable uh, risk factor you can use is the IOP. So you need to lower that to a target at which no further, or you can hinder further deterioration of uh, the uh, functional vision. And again, uh, you need to, uh, for the sake of that, uh, guess uh, or kind of predict the age of your patient because you'll be dealing with a patient differently if he's 50 years old, a healthy patient, uh, uh, compared to an 80 year old unhealthy patient. Your target pressure would definitely uh, differ in these two scenarios. So uh, these rules apply uh, to all types of glaucoma in most situations, but, but since we're talking about primary open angle glaucoma, uh, so if you're faced with such a patient, you will need to do initial assessment. And your initial assessment needs to uh, 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 include uh, the most important thing is the stage of the disease because uh, you need to know how much of the nerve is left uh, of the nerve reserve is left for you to uh, protect for the rest of the patient's life. The other thing you need to know is what was the baseline pressure that led to this damage in the nerve because that will give you an idea about the nerve's resilience. Uh, and then you factor in the patient's life expectancy uh, as you can guess it as much as you can considering their age, their health, uh, their family history, uh, and, and, and that will lead you to um, eventually get a, an estimate of the lifelong risk of uh, visual impairment impairment for that patient in particular and then accordingly to set your target pressure and of course continue to monitor your patient both at the structural level at the level of the optic nerve and the visual uh, functional level at the level of the visual field uh, because patients no matter what you do they vary in their response to the target you uh, you bring them you bring their pressures down to and the reason uh, of this variability is uh, sometimes related to the accuracy of IP measurement, as we all know, if the patients have a thinner cornea, you might be underestimating their pressures. Uh, the other thing is fluctuations in the IOP, which may go unnoticed. So in some situations, you may need to phase your patients. But the most complex reasons and the main reason for the variability in responses between different patients are intrinsic factors that have to do with the nerve's resilience and how each individual patient's nerve responds to different target pressures. And this is impossible to know from the first visit. You need to continue to see your patient because as we'll see, this is a dynamic process and we don't have up till now the tools to know how resilient the patient's nerve is. It's just through continuous uh, assessment that you can uh, readjust uh, what you believe their target pressure should be. So setting a target is almost impossible from the first time. You just have to take a guess at it. But the natural history of glaucoma for every patient is unpredictable because it depends, as we said, on factors that we don't fully understand, like the resilience of the nerve, and factors that we can't accurately predict, like the lifespan of the patient. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it remains a very individual, subjective thing. Uh, but the good news is you can always go back and readjust your target. You can change your mind about it as you continue to monitor your patient over the short and long terms. 
So why not set the target for every patient at 10 or 12 millimeter mercury, which is achievable in most patients uh, uh, with medications or surgery. You can bring down the pressure in every patient to the low teens. But of course, the side effects, understandably, and the, and the risks of doing that uh, in most in instances would outweigh the benefits. So what you really want is a pressure at which you delay or stop further deterioration of glucomics optic neuropathy. So according to the different definitions, the Academy, American Academy of Ophthalmology defined the target pressure at, as the highest pressure that would stop further deterioration of the glucomics optic neuropathy. The European Glaucoma Society, on the other hand, defined it as the average pressure that would stop further deterioration of the glaucomous optic neuropathy. But what I really like and the closest to the ideal uh, management of the glaucoma patient is Henry Gemple's definition. Uh, uh, and he defined the target pressure as the highest pressure that will not contribute to development of clinically apparent glaucomatous optic neuropathy. In other words, what he meant is that you're allowed some deterioration at the structural level, but if this passes to the end of the patient's life, unnoticed in terms of deterioration of the functional vision, then you've completely nailed it because then you've managed to give the patient the minimal uh, uh, medications or surgery or interventions with the minimal side effects and risks of of course, this is very difficult to achieve, and the more you build up experience, the more you can aim at this target, at this endpoint setting your target, uh, but it's important to keep it at the back of your mind, because most of us, of course, we can't dare to have a, a deterioration of glucometers optic neuropathy under our eyes without intervening, but it has its role in, for instance, elderly patients with mild to moderate glaucoma. So if you have a 70-year-old uh, with, uh, with a cupping of 0.4, and as you continue to monitor them over 10 or 15 years, you find that their cupping is very gradually deteriorating into a 0.6, and his visual field is still completely full, no, uh, no functional uh, uh, problem there, uh, then you've, you've achieved a good target rather than keeping them at point four with very aggressive treatment that may have a uh, life actually. So uh, the easier thing is to uh, look out for numbers. So how high is not too high? According to most studies on open angle glaucoma, a 30 to 50% reduction in IOP uh, would hinder further deterioration. But this doesn't apply to advanced glaucoma. In advanced glaucoma, if you're starting out with a pressure of 40 and you bring it down to 20 millimeter mercury, this is still not an ideal target in most cases. You need to bring it further down. So sometimes it's useful to use arbitrary numbers to set uh, your pressure in the low teens, regardless of what your starting pressure is. Uh, some have suggested formulas. Most of these are not user friendly, but it's good to know that there are uh, some formulas that incorporate a lot of factors to come up with a target. So what do we need to consider when we're setting our target? The first thing is the stage of the disease. As we said, the more advanced the, the stage, uh, the less the reserve of the optic nerve you have. So the, the, the further down you need to bring down your target. Uh, age is a very complex factor. So for younger patients, if you're dealing with a 30 or 40 year old with a long life expectancy, you need to set your target at a lower level because you need this to be, the, his nerve to be sufficient to the end of their lives over 40, 50 years. Um, and the opposite may be true for elderly patients. But for an elderly patient with some moderate to advanced glaucoma, again, you would want to set the pressure to a very low target because they've already lost, in addition to the glaucomatous optic neuropathy, they've lost some retinal nerve fibers through the wear and tear that comes with the aging process that we all go through. Uh, the baseline IP is another thing to consider. So if you're not uh, sure, you need to go back and assess the fluctuations through phasing because that's very important. Uh, if, if you're starting out with a pressure of 40, it's easier to manage them if you're starting out with a pressure of 14 or 15. Uh, of course, cornea thickness, you're all aware that it tends to underestimate the, the pressure reading if in thin corneas. But in addition to that, thin corneas are in the, an independent risk factor for progression. So it's important to know that your patients are at a higher risk uh, if they have a thinner cornea. Uh, Associated ocular diseases should be considered so a patient with exfoliation glaucoma uh, should have more aggressive lowering of the target pressure because it's known that with exfoliation glaucoma, they're more likely to progress. Uh, black race as well is more likely to progress, so you need to bring down the pressure further. But 
with all these considerations, one of the most important things is to consider the risks of treatment. The Blue Mountains Eye Study was a major study in Australia that has looked at the uh, correlation between open angle glaucoma and cardiovascular mortality, and they found a strong correlation between both, particularly in patients who are using beta blockers. So you need to consider all that when you're considering uh, lowering your uh, uh, target pressure uh, further. Um, it is important, as we said, to remember that uh, target pressure setting is a dynamic process and it will keep on changing as you continue to monitor your patient uh, for over a longer time. So you may choose to uh, opt for a higher target if you've noticed that over, let's say, a whole decade, there was no deterioration, the patient is getting older, you may allow a higher target. And on the other hand, conversely, if you find that there is progression, despite achieving your target pressure, first of all, of course, you need to exclude compliance issues, you need to exclude fluctuations in IP, phase your patient, but then you need to reconsider setting a lower target by either adding medications, doing laser, or doing a surgery. Uh, it, we need to remember always Vigorously chasing the IOP and ganglion cells can be detrimental to the health of our patients. So sometimes you may settle for a target pressure that is slightly higher than what you would want uh, instead of en escalating to the next level of treatment, which may have its uh, harmful effect on your patient's health or quality of life. So if we look for one more time at our goals, we need to, again, maintain the best functional vision to the end of the patient's life and with the best quality of life. So the last word here is on quality of life, uh, which should not be underestimated. Uh, uh, no matter how much we engage our patients in chasing the IOP and ganglion cells and how much, and no matter how much they, uh, they appear to us, like they are, uh, what they really want at the end of the day is to have a good quality of life. They want to live independently, be able to drive, uh, 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 not be uh, exposed to the risks of uh, operations or, or, or uh, additional medical treatments if they're not really indicated. So this is really the actual target that we need to focus on in, during, in dealing with our patients. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Yasmin, uh, thank you very much. That's really uh, wonderful. Um, Yasmin, can I ask you, uh, uh, can you set a different target for uh, each eye separately? Because, you know, the glaucoma is asymmetric of disease. So that how you manage this? Absolutely, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, if one eye is more advanced than the other, you can definitely set a lower pressure for, more, for, uh, for the more advanced uh, eye. So um, you still, you know, that there are recommendations for the uh, target intraocular pressure according to the stage of the disease. You have clearly mentioned that. So that do you have to recheck this with every patient individually? I mean, if you say, for if you meet a patient like with advanced disease, and you know, for example, the pressure should be 14, and now the pressure is 17. Uh, do you work to check that 17 is fine, or you just decide to go? Um, for a lower IOP, so how do you, uh, do you reset for every patient or do you depend on guidelines? Yeah, exactly. This is a great question, Dr. Ahmed. It's always an individual thing and we have to always be open to change our minds. So if, if I need to bring down the pressure from 17 to 14 with an extra medication that may affect the patient's health, and this patient, let's say, is an elderly patient with moderate disease, and I would feel that uh, a deterioration at the structural level will not be noticed to the end of their life, I can continue to monitor on a pressure of 17, definitely. But if I find that there is some deterioration at the functional level, then I'll go back to an even lower pressure. So so um, you always balance the risks and benefits of, of adding or escalating treatments. No, I totally agree with you because there is a damaging pressure, which is definitely might be different from one patient to the other. Yes, yes, that's, that's great. Uh, there is a question for you, Yasmin, as well. When can I reach target intraocular pressure after starting topical medications? next day, next week, or for how long do you have to wait? It should be immediate. It should be immediate. There is some cumulative effect over time, but it, we should not give it a lot of weight because over time as well, there will be tolerance to some of the medications. So they kind of balance each other out. So once your patient, the patient starts on medications, and we know that in patients, for, set, for instance, with acute angle closure uh, attacks, well, once you start their treatment, uh, by, in a couple of hours or three or four hours, they would... Uh, 
uh, their pressure will come down. So patients sometimes think that uh, I've just started using the medications yesterday. You can't judge the pressure accordingly. No, you can uh, because they should start immediately. Um, yeah. Heather, you, you expect uh, the full effect uh, next day, for example. You, you may get, time. yeah, it depends on the molecule you're using, but you might, ha you may have some curative, cumulative effect over time, uh, but I don't give that much weight, well, but because eventually uh, over a longer period, they may get tolerance to medications uh, and, and their effects uh, would be uh, less. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That's really great. Um, uh, so till the end, uh, we were we are receiving uh, questions so that uh, we will postpone further discussion to the end for the interest of time. Thank you very much, Yasmin. That was great. Uh, now the next talk is by uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Iman Magdi. Uh, Dr. Iman will give a talk on ocular hypertension and the glaucoma suspect, and we are all uh, motivated and eager to know the guidelines. Uh, in those uh, very uh, difficult patients to make decisions uh, on them. Uh, Dr. Imam, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this webinar. Uh, if we speak about the ocular hypertension and the primary open angle glaucoma suspects, uh, what is a glaucoma suspect or who is a glaucoma suspect? Um, an easy way to look at it is uh, the suspect is a patient uh, in which one of the corner stones of the famous glaucoma triangle uh, of diagnosis is missing. So it's either a patient with a, nor with a normal intraocular pressure, um, yet with the changes in the optic nerve head or a field, or a patient with a, a high intraocular pressure in which the optic nerve head and the field are still normal. So it's one of the corners of the triangles are missing. Uh, we cannot detect, uh, we cannot diagnose glaucoma, but we can uh, suspect it. Uh, clinically, I would like to look at these patients um, as two types, primary open angle glaucoma suspects, uh, type one. This is the ocular hypertensive patient in which the repeatedly high intraocular pressure is detected above 21 millimeters of mercury without evident optic nerve head or field affection. And a suspect type two in which there is a suspicious looking optic disc or an optic disc uh, cupping uh, with, a, with a low or normal baseline intraocular pressure. Why are we defining them in this, in this way? Because the recommended regimens for treating both types will vary. Uh, of course, we cannot speak about the glaucoma suspect without mentioning the ocular hypertension treatment study, uh, especially type 1 suspect, the ocular hypertensive. This study was uh, published in 2002, and it was a randomized trial on a, a large number of patients testing the, the safety and efficacy of hypotensive, uh, topical hypotensive medications in delaying or preventing uh, glaucoma in, um, in these patients. The target was to achieve 24 millimeters of mercury IOP or less. Uh, or a 20% reduction, or both. Uh, Follow-up uh, of these patients uh, was maintained for five years, and uh, the results showed that the cumulative probability of developing glaucoma was 4.4% in the treated group versus 9.5% in the untreated group. So, uh, so treatment actually reduced the incidence of, of uh, conversion to manifest glaucoma by about 50%. Uh, the study also published uh, predictors according to a univariate and multivariate analysis, the high-risk uh, people who are the uh, predictors for development of glaucoma was found in older age patients, larger vertical CD ratio, a greater pattern standard deviation on field examination, a higher baseline intraocular pressure, and a thinner uh, central cornea. Uh, okay, how about glaucoma suspect type 2? Uh, here, I depended on the uh, American Academy preferred practice patterns. Uh, uh, I know that there is not a clear consensus about the glaucoma suspect, a solid consensus, but most papers uh, and guidelines agree that a primary open angle glaucoma suspect um, should have one of the following. Asymmetry in intraocular pressure uh, of more than four millimeters of mercury between the two eyes not necessarily high pressure, but asymmetry in pressure, a suspicious looking optic disc, whether rim notching, rim thinning, splint or hemorrhage, uh, cupping, of course, increased CD ratio, especially the vertical CD ratio, um, asymmetry in CD ratio and uh, early or uh, some uh, visual field changes. What further 
uh, complicates the risk or makes it a higher risk patient or a higher risk suspect is one of these. Having a thinner central corneal thickness, the age um, uh, older than 40 years, uh, being a simple myope of up to four diopters, having a parent or a sibling with glaucoma or a glaucoma suspect, uh, being of African American race and having type two diabetes. Um, these, uh, this is a diagram showing some uh, uh, like uh, diagrams of possible suspicious looking optic discs like here we have retinal nerve uh, fiber layer defects, uh, thinning of the rim, uh, increased vertical CD ratio and a splinter hemorrhage at the edge of the disc. Uh, some field uh, patterns which we usually see are paracentral scotomata or early nasal steps but the general guidelines to the management of suspects uh, are, are um, uh, put in four major points, whether suspect one or suspect two. First, establish a baseline intraocular pressure. That means measure the intraocular pressure more than three times at different times of the day. Establish a mean, a mean baseline intraocular pressure. And, in, uh, and uh, nowadays you can also have a baseline field, baseline OCT, this will be all beneficial in having a baseline condition. And number two, determine the risk, the risk of damage. Which patient is a high risk suspect and which patient is a low risk suspect? Uh, number three, decide whether or not you will treat this IOP, whether it is high or low, but that would decide or not whether, because, because it's the only treatable risk factor, the intraocular pressure. Uh, and whether you decide or not uh, to treat, in all cases, observe this suspect for worsening. Uh, because once you get evidence of worsening, uh, then this suspect, you'll change from uh, calling him a suspect to calling him an early glaucoma patient and the management, of course, will differ. Uh, how about the guidelines for suspect number one, the, op the ocular hypertensive patient? Uh, high risk, uh, uh, ocular hypertensive patients can be um, divided into high risk suspects, low risk suspects, and intermediate risk. Uh, the low risk suspects is a patient whose intraocular pressure is high, but is less than 32. The central corneal thickness is more than 588. Uh, this, these patients are low risk suspects. Here we, we just need to observe. We don't need to treat these patients. The high risk suspect on the other hand is a patient who has a 20% risk of developing manifest glaucoma within five years. Uh, it's either the ocular hypertensive patient with an intraocular pressure of 32, or more at, in, at initial presentation. The baseline IOP is very high, above 32. Uh, uh, an ocular hypertensive patient with a central corneal thickness of less than 555 microns with a vertical CD ratio, with an increase in vertical CD ratio and or uh, an intraocular pressure more than 26. So if you have a patient with 32 initially, higher than 32, that's a high risk suspect. You should treat this uh, intraocular pressure. If the pressure is above 26 with a cent, uh, thin central cornea and or increased vertical CD ratio, you should, we, you, you should also treat this suspect. And if you have uh, a moderate risk suspect in which you cannot visualize the disc or in which the field is unreliable. This patient cannot uh, withstand the field test or has a media opacity. So you cannot really follow up the disc and field. In, in, in this case only you can treat this, um, uh, or if the patient insists actually, uh, we'll, we'll go to, uh, these, these are the high risk uh, suspects in which you should treat and, uh, and follow up. Uh, moderate risk suspects fall between the two categories. They are people with a corneal thickness from 555 to 588 microns, who are in, whose intraocular pressure are, are lower than 26 and with a normal VCD. Uh, uh, here we have to weigh the risk uh, of medication versus, versus the benefit. We should also uh, consider a media opacity and the difficulty of follow-up. We should and we should put the patient's uh, preference in in um, uh, in the calcul in the equation. Uh, this algorithm shows, as we said, the high the high IOP initially. Yes, that's a high risk suspect. Uh, okay, so look at the OCT nerve fiber layer or visual field defect. If there is no defect and the corneal thickness is about uh, is more than 588, this is also a low risk, risk suspect. If the uh, if the corneal thickness is uh, less than 555 uh, without uh, VCD uh, increase or intraocular pressure is less than 26, then this is a medium risk suspect. Uh, and if not, then this is also a high risk suspect. We treat, we set a target pressure and we treat. Uh, a medium risk suspect, uh, we, we ask the patient, if a patient strongly prefers treatment, then yes, 
we can uh, try a therapeutic trial of topical medication if he doesn't prefer treatment uh, and the optic disc cannot, can be easily visualized and followed up, um, then it's okay. If not, then, uh, then we, uh, if the visual field and test, uh, the optic disc cannot be examined clearly, then we try a therapeutic trial of topical medications. These are mostly the guidelines for suspect number one, the ocular hypertensive. Uh, some little differences we'll, we'll take a look at in suspect number two. There are a bit of differences. Why? Because suspect number two, there may be some confounding factors in people with uh, cupping without increase in intraocular pressure. That suspect two is a, is, is, a, is a suspect with a low or normal baseline intraocular pressure. So we find cupping. What about this cupping? How, how about if it's a physiological cupping? How about if the field defect uh, with, we find is due to another confounding pathology? Especially if the patient is less than 50 years of age and if the visual acuity is severely affected out of proportion to the media clarity, uh, then here we have to exclude confounding factors uh, that, uh, with, uh, that could be uh, co coexisting with this cupping. Um, example number one is a cupping with a reliable normal field. Here we obtain, we prefer to obtain an OCT retinal nerve fiber layer. If we have cupping with a low baseline IOP and a normal retinal nerve fiber layer and a normal contour on OCT, then this is mostly a physiologic cupping. No treatment is required. This is not considered a suspect, but however, follow up this patient. Still, we, we need to follow up this patient. If not, if the OCT is affected, no, then this is a glaucoma suspect. This is the first scenario. A second scenario, we have to make sure, we have to beware of coexisting um, uh, cupping uh, with a, a bi bitemporal or a homonymous hemianopia. If you have vertical field defects, this could be from intracranial disease, chiasmal or post-chiasmal. It, uh, although descending optic atrophy also uh, always or usually leads to a pale disc, it can also be pr present in patients with previous physiologic cupping. So it could uh, confuse with a glaucoma suspect. If you have previously physiologic cupping along with field defects, uh, this could uh, confuse with the glaucoma. But but if the vertical, if the visual field defects is bitemporal or uh, homonymous, then this is uh, probably an intracranial disease. Uh, how about cupping? with a central scotoma or a scotoma close to fixation. Uh, glaucoma can be one of the, of course, uh, causes causing this type of field effect. However, macular disease, optic disc drusen and compressive, compressive optic neuropathy uh, also may uh, contribute to a central scotoma. Uh, glaucoma here, uh, especially in people with myopic uh, refraction um, or severe glaucoma or normal tension glaucoma, uh, these are the cases in which the visual field defects are close to fixation. Um, if, if the scotoma uh, is not near fixation and it's not a bitemporal, here, this is the, the whole flow chart. Uh, is the visual field uh, reliable and normal? No. If it, is it vertical, bitemporal, homonymous? No. If it's, is it close to fixation? If no, then uh, we have the, 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 the common or the more common arcuate uh, nerve fiber uh, bundle defects. These are arcuate defects usually crossing the midline, the vertical midline, and uh, we have to, before we say it's a glaucoma suspect, these arcuate defects are, uh, are due to suspicion of glaucoma, we have to exclude retinal vascular occlusions, optic disc drusen, and anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. These are uh, excluded mainly by clinical examination. Retinal vascular occlusions, we, we will find shunt vessels at the disc, we can find retinal vessel thinning. Uh, in optic disc drusen can be excluded by echography, Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy uh, can be suspected by uh, segmental pallor or pallor out of proportion to the cupping uh, can be confirmed by fluorescein and other testing. Uh, if, if all of these are not present, then we have to um, consider a glaucoma suspect. Uh, I, I here highlighted the three conditions in this algorithm, glaucoma suspect number two, that is cupping with a low or normal baseline IOP. It's either uh, someone with the cupping and the retinal nerve fiber layer changes. This is a suspect. Uh, uh, cupping with a scotoma near or at fixation. It, it could be glaucoma. And arc with nerve bundle defects, which are not due to uh, retinal vascular diseases, optic disc drusen, uh, or anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So, 
Uh, can we uh, divide the glaucoma suspect number two into low risk and high risk suspects uh, uh, like, gluco like in glaucoma uh, suspect number one? Yes. Uh, studies uh, suggested that based on the visual field defects that are present, um, a patient with a cupping and low baseline IOP with no field loss with no or minimal field loss is a low risk suspect. Uh, in this case, the progression of disease is unlikely. And even if visual field defects start to appear, uh, you can usually, they will be very slow to progress and you can detect them before major damage occurs. However, in, uh, if the abnormal field has uh, like arc with defects or paracentral scotomata is, are, are present, especially if they are dense and close to fixation, this is a high risk suspect you better uh, follow up the suspect and even treat this IOP. Uh, so overall, if we look at both types of glaucoma suspect, uh, which suspect to treat, we will find that in, type, in, in suspect number one, the ocular hypertens uh, hypertensive patient, we treat patients with intraocular pressure uh, higher than 32. We treat patients with a pressure uh, that is higher than 26 plus minus vertical CD ratio of more than 0.3 with a thin cornea, we treat these patients as well, and the moderate risk suspects in which the, we cannot obtain a reliable field or the, in which there is a difficult disc examination. In, in suspect type number two, the uh, patients with a normal baseline or uh, IOP, we, we rely on the visual field. Uh, uh, cupping that is not physiologic, and that is associated with arc with defects, central or paracentral dense scotomas uh, are better treated uh, we better treat the IOP. We better, of course, set the target pressure like Dr. Yasmin has uh, nicely explained. Uh, um, but in, to conclude, uh, suspects with initially high IOP are managed differently from suspects with a low baseline IOP, especially if the age is young and the visual uh, uh, acuity is, uh, is affected. We have to exclude other diseases first. If we, uh, if we confirm that this is a glau glaucoma suspect, then we identify high risk suspects from low risk suspects. We decide whether or not we will treat the IOP. Uh, we aim at 20% uh, reduction in IOP. That, that, that is based upon the ocular hypertension treatment study, but uh, I would prefer uh, the, uh, the analyzed form of aiming uh, of target pressure uh, um, uh, De, yani, uh, determining the target pressure using Dr. Yasmin's uh, algorithms, uh, uh, we aim at uh, reduction of IOP uh, from the mean, about 20% from the mean pre-treatment values. And finally, don't forget to observe your suspect, whether you are treating the IOP or not. Observe, observe, observe uh, to detect worsening. Uh, and uh, that's all for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is really great, Iman. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems that uh, yes, th this is a very dynamic field for the uh, for the evaluation of the glaucoma suspect because um, the recommendations for the European glaucoma guidelines uh, in the version of 2014 that patients with pressure greater than 16 they are having a 12 percent greater chance of developing glaucoma. So it seems. Mm -hmm that uh, things are changing. And also I got the impression from your talk that we are uh, definitely over-treating our patients because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes. if, you, if you have a patient with a pressure, uh, 28, you will be so nervous before even exactly. uh, assessing the corneal thickness so that it seems that uh, uh, sticking to the, uh, uh, stuck into the guidelines, it's uh, really important because it, it helps you from taking personal uh, decisions. So uh, thank you for that, that's really great. Uh, and yeah. definitely the, the, the intraocular pressure, the mean intraocular pressure was taken from a sample of uh, Caucasian people uh, with, the, with, with the, the value that the upper limit is like 21 and 22, but still this uh, may change with uh, races, uh, a lot, uh, a lot of the studies are still needed to further determine the optimum uh, intraocular pressure for each race. So that, um, um, uh, do you have any question for the panel? Do you have question for Iman? This is a, a very uh, motivating talk, really. Okay. So um, 
we will come back for a group discussion. Now, may I invite my dear friend, uh, Dr. Heber Magdi, uh, it's a big star also in the field. We are all stars really in the field of glaucoma. Uh, and Dr. Heber will uh, discuss the uh, guidelines in the medical uh, therapy. So, Heber, uh, please. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be with you uh, in this event. Uh, now we are going to speak about the medical therapy guidelines in primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, the aim of the treatment of the glaucoma is to minimize the risk of glaucoma disease progression by reducing the intraocular pressure, which is the only viable factor in the pathogenesis of the glaucoma. The interaction between the patient and the disease is unique. Actually, this interaction is unique for every eye. You can rarely find a similar glaucomatous eye to another, even in the same person. So management for each eye must always be individualized. Don't forget that the anti-glaucoma treatment is a lifelong therapy. So you have to know well and to teach the patient the principle of the topical treatment. First of all, start with the least offensive drug regarding the ocular and the systemic side effect regarding the cause as well as the dose of this drug. Encourage the patient for gentle lead closure and punctual occlusion after the eye drop application. This will increase the ocular absorption and will also decrease the systemic absorption of the drug, thus decreasing the systemic side effects. Use as few drugs as possible. One medication or fixed combination is easier to be used. Medications that are used once or twice are more tolerable than those used more frequently. And of course, the patient's adherence to the therapy are better with fewest number of eye drops with the least systemic as well as the local side effects. If you have to use more than one eye drop, so you should allow time for each eye drop to be absorbed. You should instruct the patient to make at least 10 minutes difference between the different eye drops. Finally, you should give the patient a clear written instruction. We have a lot of anti-glaucoma medication. What are the, these medications. This anti-glaucoma medication to reduce the intraocular pressure will act either uh, in the form of reduction of the aqueous humor secretion as the beta blockers, the alpha agonist or the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, or they will decrease the intraocular pressure by increasing the trabecular aqueous outflow like the mas mascarinic agents, the pilocarpine, or they will increase the uveous scleral outflow as the prostaglandin drugs. We really have a lot of options. How can you choose the proper anti-glaucoma medication? According to the American Academy guidelines, the treatment is usually started with either prostaglandin analog or beta blocker. We still have two options, prostaglandin or beta blocker. Start with which one of them. After discussing all of the possible side effects with the patient, you have to discuss with the patient everything regarding the state of his disease as well as the medical treatment options with great honesty and explaining all of the side effects. Use the agent that has fewer relative contraindication. If only unilateral treatment is needed, please avoid the prostaglandin analogues. If the patient has multiple systemic diseases or he is on systemic beta blockers, so beta blocker, topical beta blocker will have no value in this patient. Prostaglandin is preferable in this type of patients. When you use prostaglandin as first medicine, we have different preparations. We have the latanoprost, bimatoprost, traboprost, and we have the tafloprost, which is the only preservative-free uh, form in our country. Uh, prostaglandin in general increase the uveous scleral outflow, and they have the greatest uh, intraocular pressure uh, um, reducing ability, up to 33%, and they have the greatest benefit of uh, uh, being uh, used once daily at night. But of course, we all know the uh, undesirable uh, local side effects in some patients regarding the long, maldirected lashes, the hyperpigmentation of the periocular skin and the hyperpigmentation of the iris, the severe conjunctival hypremia, and sometimes the cystoid macular edema. The beta blockers as first medication, we have the problem of the selectivity. Timolol is the non-selective beta blocker. It may increase the airway resistance and decrease the cardiac output, so it may exacerbate asthma and congestive heart failure. Here comes the betaxolol, which is the selective beta-1 blocker and has less effect on the bronchi and the heart. Beta blockers in general decrease the aqueous humor production and they reduce the intraocular pressure by up to 25%. 
and they are used twice daily. But here it's very important to instruct the patient about the second dose, the timing of the second dose of the beta blocker. Try to avoid the bedtime dose. Instruct the patient to use it in the early evening because the beta blockers has little or no effect on the echo's formation during sleep. So if he put it in the bedtime, it's useless dose. After prescribing either the beta blocker or prostaglandin, you have to evaluate the effect of your treatment. How can you evaluate? In the first follow-up visit, please don't rush to measure the intraocular pressure. You have to speak with the patient first. Determine if the patient is taking and tolerating the treatment or not. Ask if the patient understood the directions or not. Believe me, a lot of patients does not believe your instructions in the first visit. Ask specifically if the patient had any side effect or any change in the medical status. Record when the patient last took the medication. After all of these questions, now you can determine if the prescribed medication is pressure lowering or not through the assessment of the intraocular pressure. Okay, before judging the effectiveness of the chosen medication, take care of the following, please. First, if you use the beta blockers, the beta blocker okay considerably decrease the intraocular pressure but the pressure may take sometimes up to one to two weeks to stabilize so the full pressure lowering effect of the beta blockers may take up to one to two weeks so if you see the patient on the first or second day and you don't find the desired pressure lowering don't rush you have to wait for one to two weeks but of course you can wait if you have the luxury of time if you are not dealing with an advanced case with really Pre, uh, with really high pre-treatment intraocular pressure. Also, there is a very important point in the beta blocker. The, the lowered intraocular pressure with the beta blockers may not be maintained through a long follow-up. So to decide uh, the intraocular pressure will be maintained or not at the desired level, you have to wait for one to two months, which is needed to decide the chronic follow-up with beta blockers. On the other hand, we have the prostaglandin. The prostaglandin, the intraocular pressure lowering, the, the action, it will start after, the full action will start after three to four hours. The th after three to four hours, the intraocular pressure is reduced by the prostaglandin. But here, some of the side effects will take some time to appear. So again, you have to wait for one to two weeks to decide whether to use the prostaglandin to lower the intraocular pressure, but this lowering of the intraocular pressure should also be tolerated by the patient and there is, the, the eye drop should be tolerated by the patient with no uh, undesirable side effects. So you have to wait for one to two weeks. Okay. If the desired intraocular pressure is still not reached, kindly check and recheck for the adherence. As adequate treatment to lower the intraocular pressure requires high level of adherence to the therapy. And several studies denote that nearly 45% of the patients are not adherent to their treatment, even with clear instructions and even with free medications and even with once daily administered. Adherence is really, really difficult. If the intraocular pressure, the target intraocular pressure is not achieved, you have to adjust the treatment. And also you can adjust the treatment if the patient is not tolerant to the prescribed medication or if the patient is not adherent to the prescribed indication, or any contraindication has appeared during the, uh, the, the, the use of the uh, eye drops. But how to adjust the treatment? You have to be wise during the adjustment. First, switch to another monotherapy alternative. Example, if you were on beta blocker, try to shift it to prostaglandin, okay? Adding additional medication one by one till the target intraocular pressure is reached, and here is the value of the fixed combination that may improve the patient adherence. What are the other anti-glaucoma medications we can add to either prostaglandin analog or beta blocker or even both? We have the alpha adrenergic agonists. They can reduce the intraocular pressure by 25%, but they have the potential side effect of the allergic conjunctivitis. Okay, we also have the parasympathomimetics, metrics, the pilocarpine. It increase, decreases the intraocular pressure by 25%, but they also have the side effect of uh, um, uh, induction of cataract, uh, a reduction of the visual uh, field, uh, brow aches. Okay. We have also the topical and the systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which reduce the intraocular pressure by 20%. Of course, the systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they result into the hypokalemia with the associated paresthesia, abdominal cramps, 
uh, and the diarrhea with the prolonged use, it can lead to renal stones. Actually, this systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, they are used as temporary measures um, uh, to lower the intraocular pressure temporarily, uh, for example, before surgeries. Okay. And we have, of course, the blessing of the fixed combination uh, for the anti block medication, prostaglandin beta blockers, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, beta blockers, and alpha agonists. And we have alpha agonists with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. What about certain situations you have to treat the glaucoma with? What about the pregnancy? Anti-glaucoma treatment during pregnancy is a very important issue. The challenge here is to keep the balance between the glaucoma progression, again, is the concern for the safety of the fetus. Actually, we don't have a really safe anti-glaucoma treatment that can be used safely in the pregnant uh, female. But thanks to God, thanks to God that only the pregnancy hormones without any medications can reduce the intraocular pressure by 24%. It's a really a blessing. There is an FDA drug pregnancy category and our anti glaucoma medication line in the category B and in the category C. Category B means that in the animal studies, there is no risk, fact, risk effect on the fetus, but there is no human study. And in the category C, the animal studies show there is an adverse effect on the fetus, but there is no uh, human studies. Actually, all of the anti glaucoma medication, they, are, they belong to the group C. Group C, again, it means that in the animal study, there is adverse effect to the fetus. The only group, uh, the only uh, drug that in group B is, is the alpha agonist. The alpha agonist, it lies in the group B, so it can be used safely in the first and second trimester, but avoid its use close to the delivery because of neonatal effect as it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Beta blockers, the use in the first and second trimester is really questionable, and you have to monitor closely the fetal heart. The prostaglandin they can use in the second and early third trimester, avoid its close use, um, close to the delivery, to avoid theoretical preterm labor as it can induce uterine contraction. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, it can be used in the late second and in the third trimester, but not in the first, because it has high risk for development of fetal vertebral body malformation and decrease the fetal weight. During the breastfeeding, all are safe except the alpha agonist. Alpha agonist is really contraindicated in uh, during the, uh, the breastfeeding because it has the risk for the CNS depression and it may result into a respiratory apnea and uh, bradycardia to the patient. So it's contraindicated. You can use beta blocker, okay, but take care in patients with cardiopulmonary disease. Prostaglandin, they are extremely safe. Actually, they have very short half-life time. Once in the mother's bloodstream, the half-life time of these uh, eye drops is just 17 minutes. So just instruct the mother, avoid breastfeeding immediately after putting the eye drops. To summarize, in the first trimester, you can use safely primonidine. Beta blocker, questionable. In the second trimester, you can use primonidine, beta blocker, prostaglandin analog. In the third trimester, you can use prostaglandin analog, but take care from the uterine contractions. You can use beta blockers, take care about the uh, fetal heart rate. You can use safely carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and the pilocarpine. During the breastfeeding uh, time, prostaglandin analog, they are very safe, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and beta blockers, but take care again of the fetal heart rate. And uh, that's all for the uh, guidelines for the medical treatment. I'm hoping that you have uh, um, enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, but thank you very much. That's really great. Thank you very, very much. And to the point, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Heba, for yourself, then, um, so what's the first drug you start with when you see a patient? Because there is always, I see that uh, beta blockers is still on the top of the agenda, and I'm not quite sure that we use beta blockers anymore. Yeah, I myself, I really prefer prostaglandin as the first line of treatment. Uh, then, if it's not um, uh, to tolerated by the patient, I can shift to the beta blockers. But the first line uh, is the beta block is a prostaglandin to me. So, any of the panelists have uh, a different opinion? So, you all agree that uh, beta blockers uh, are not uh, the, the the first option that you go for prostaglandin. I actually do the same. Yes. Yes. Dr. Ahmed, maybe in yes. deferitis patients. I see a lot of deferitis patients 
Uh, and, and in these cases, uh, I might go for a beta blocker instead of a prostaglandin as a primary uh, thing. And in pregnant ladies or those who might, yeah, who are, who might get pregnant. So these are the only indications I can think of, unless you're oh, using sir. it for a combination. Mm. Sorry, Dr. Yasmin, pregnant ladies and what? What, what was the first? Uh... And patients with blepharitis, which are quite common. Oh, mm. okay. Yeah. So uh, these Dr. are the only indications I can think of. Oh, that, that, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And then um, there is another question for you, Heba, that do you start yeah. lubricants from the beginning um, uh, yeah. of the treatment or you wait until the patient develops a kind of dry eye? Um, uh, no, um, if the patient already have dry eye, of course, the lubricants are prescribed uh, from the beginning. Uh, if not, I, I, I usually um, I, afraid of the multiple medications. Um, I, I'm afraid they, they, they will not uh, comply with the uh, multiple medications, uh, so they might forget one of the doses of the anti-glaucoma treatment. So if there is no indication for to start uh, uh, lubricant first, uh, I usually uh, don't. I usually don't uh, prescribe it from the start. Okay, and then um, there is another question for you. For you, the patient is yeah. having normal tension glaucoma. Um, yes. Would you start with prostaglandin, or are yeah. you going to change? Uh, yes, the prostaglandin. The same. You start actually, with prostaglandin. The, yes, the, actually, this is the only drug that can work at low tension. Uh, this is the drug of choice, actually, in the normal tension glaucoma. Yes, that's really interesting. Ahiba, yes. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very, me. very much. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, we will move to uh, Dr. Rasha Munir El Tanamli. Uh, Dr. Rasha, she is the one who is highly specialized in evidence-based medicine. So that if you wanted to just know the full data about the evidence-based medicine in any point, just consult Dr. Rasha. We have been working together for quite long uh, years. She is very trustable. I really love working with her. She's a great person. Uh, Rasha, thank you very much for being with us today. Please go ahead. When we talk about lasers, and the role of lasers have always been um, described as to be used as an ancillary treatment in cases of uncontrolled intraocular pressure, despite maximally tolerated medical therapy in patients who have difficulties to administer the drop or in non-compliant or difficulty in adherence, um, pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma, and in patients who have difficulties to undergo surgery um, due to systemic status. But recently, the role of laser um, has expanded, and again, Yes, uh, yeah. to include those patients who are recently diagnosed. And we have like this trend of, do we start by um, using laser in these patients or do we revert to the classic teaching or the classic um, use of medications as Dr. Heba has elaborated on all the medications with their side effects and everything. Um, and this question has been addressed in uh, in the research, and the first trial to address this question was the laser glaucoma trial. And again, when we look at um, trials or evidence or literature, we look at the level of evidence and we try and um, uh, extract our information from the research with the highest level of evidence that is system systematic review, meta-analysis, followed by randomized control, double-blinded studies, and we go down in the pyramid of evidence till the very last or the bottom of the pyramid, which is animal research and uh, in vitro research. So uh, when we talk about the first trial to uh, discuss uh, the role or the use of lasers as primary modality for treatment and comparing it to medical uh, treatment. That was the glaucoma laser trial. And the results were first published in ophthalmology uh, in the year 1990. And in that trial, uh, investigators have actually um, uh, recruited 271 patients and they randomized them into one eye to receiving organ laser trabeculoplasty and the other eye to receiving um, medications in the form of timolol maliate 0.5%. And they have followed those patients for two years uh, and 
at the end of the follow-up, they found that uh, the, there was no major difference in the outcome. Actually, there was um, a slight favor in, um, uh, in the laser first group, uh, but more or less both groups were similar. There was no major differences in the uh, pressure in the visual acuity or in the visual field over the two years of follow-up. Uh, they even extrapolated on that and when they had um, when they released a longer follow-up uh, trial or, um, of the patients for seven years, and they have still the same conclusion. They concluded that initial treatment with organ laser trabeculoplasty was at least as efficacious as the initial treatment with topical medications. So we had this um, very respectable trial on uh, the use of organ laser trabeculoplasty as a primary or first modality in treatment as compared to the uh, beta blockers, which was then the only um, medication or the, the um, preferred medication as first line of treatment. But now we have actually abandoned organ laser trabeculoplasty in our practice in favor of SLT or selective laser trabeculoplasty. And I started looking at the evidence for uh, SLT as a primary or adjunctive um, modality of treatment in cases of open angle glaucoma. And uh, in this uh, prospective study that we have conducted with, um, in the year 12, uh, in the year 2012, uh, we had 106 patients uh, that were um, divided into two groups. One had undergone SLT as a primary medication, as a primary um, treatment, and um, 65 patients had SLT as adjunctive uh, treatment in addition to their um, medications. And after 18 months of follow-up, uh, both groups have had substantial drop of intraocular pressure and um, the, the laser was quite as effective in both groups. And in that study, we actually applied laser for 360 degrees and we have applied 100 non-overlapping shots uh, of uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty. So, but then that was a prospective uh, um, cohort study. That's not the highest level of evidence. So looking at further evidence uh, addressing our question, this is a um, review or, uh, of um, of randomized uh, studies uh, previously conducted. And this uh, review was um, published in the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology in the year 2014. And following this review, uh, the authors have um, simply um, said that there is very, that the evidence support the use of SLT as a primary uh, and first line of therapy in glaucoma, and that is due to its several advantages, its efficacy in lowering the pressure, its uh, cost effectiveness in comparison to the eye drops, and the idea or the concept of repeatability. Uh, because as we will, as you all know, that SLT can be easily repeated uh, when when compared to the old argon laser trabeculoplasty. Another study uh, that was again published in 2015, and it is a systematic review and meta-analysis, which is the highest level of evidence um, about selective laser trabeculoplasty and its uh, benefit. And in that systematic review, the authors have um, figured or, or have concluded that SLT is as efficacious as ALT uh, as, uh, in lowering the intraocular pressure with less, um, with less um, complications. But the highlight, okay, but the highlight of the practice now, now is the LIGHT study. And the LIGHT study has been published published very recently in the Lancet in the year 2019. And this is a masked randomized um, control trial involving multi-centers, many centers. And it was addressing this specific question, which is uh, the use of medications 
uh, in the form of prostaglandin analogues versus the use of selective laser trabeculoplasty as first line of treatment in patients. And uh, in this study, they, the researchers have um, included 718 eyes of 718 patients that were randomized into either prostaglandin analogues, as I said, or SLT. And they have followed those patients up for up to three years and uh, published the results. Their out the outcome, whether primary or secondary, was the primary outcome was assessing the quality of life of the patients, where the secondary outcome was assessing any change in the visual acuity, any drop of intraocular pressure or the rate of drop of intraocular pressure, uh, the cost of either procedure, the progression of glaucoma, and the need for further surgery. And after three years of follow-up, the LIGHT study have published again uh, the results that says that SLT is both clinically effective and cost-effective option uh, for first-line treatment in cases of primary open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. And that it may spare the patient's eye drops. It will definitely reduce uh, the cost of, um, it will spare the patient's the eye drops and reduce the cost of treatment. And it will re also reduce the risk of future glaucoma surgery. Now that's even was um, further uh, solidified by a follow-up for this study that was still under, uh, it's impressed, still under, um, yani, um, ahead of uh, publication, I mean, and it was, uh, it's going to be published in ophthalmology, and they have looked at the visual field outcomes from both groups of the light study, and in their um, interpretation, they have actually found that patients who have underwent SLT had slightly better um, visual field parameters and they are less likely to have rapid progression than those who were on medications. So that's like uh, these two uh, results or of the light uh, trial can be very um, intriguing and they can lead us to change our practice patterns. And this is actually what happened. The NICE guidelines, which are the National Institute of Health and Care uh, Excellence uh, in the UK have updated their guidelines following the light um, trial or the light study to include laser SLT as a primary modality of treatment in cases of recently diagnosed open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. The same is also uh, mentioned in the preferred practice pattern guidelines from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And as you can see, uh, they have mentioned that laser trabeculoplasty can be considered as initial therapy in select patients of open angle glaucoma. So we can conclude that uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty is as effective as medications for primary treatment of open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. Um, selective laser trabeculoplasty is more cost effective and it has influenced the quality of life in a better way of the patients and that it may delay field progression. These are, I think, new um, changes in in the game, we can actually start applying or thinking of applying SLT as first line of treatment for our patients, especially those who have uh, systemic side disease uh, effect, especially those who have difficulties with uh, putting the medications or non-adherence or those who are just forgetful. If, if you have patients who will, you feel that they will not uh, be as compliant as you wish, I think this offers a new door for patients to um, and like um, something for them to help um, in the uh, modalities. One again, 
something, you know, an extra thing that would help us with uh, managing these patients. And thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the glitches again. Thank you, Rasha. That was great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, really excellent talk and to the point. Uh, and uh, definitely there is a change in the game nowadays with the introduction of a technology like SLT. It is not a new technology, but I guess there is a, a lot of research um, in the last years which pushed that uh, line of management up uh, even before the medical treatment. Rasha, let me ask you, did you, did you come across uh, uh, a number in the intraocular pressure uh, on the presentation in which SLT is not indicated? I, I mean, if the patient is presenting with a pressure of 25, for example, then it seems like a good option. But if the patient is presenting with a pressure of 32, for example, then is that a good option to start with as well, or do you have a different policy? I, I would still start, give it a trial, because um, the response of the patients is very variable. We had some patients with a drop of intraocular pressure to up to 49 and 50%, which is amazing. So why not? I mean, at least we will not lose anything by trying. Yes, of course, I, I if the patient is, yeah, if the patient is very advanced, maybe I, I would reconsider, but in a freshly diagnosed patient, reasonable optic nerve head, I would go for that. So another question for you, Rasha, then, uh, does SLT play a role um, after angle surgery or after filtering surgery so that if the pressure is started to rise, you think SLT would play a role? Uh, yes, there has been a few, but only a few studies uh, testing SLT following glaucoma surgery. And it, they, they have, um, the authors have um, mentioned or have concluded that yes, it can lead to some uh, drop of intraocular pressure. So it can be applied, yes. Interesting then, uh, what about the micropulse laser trabeculoplasty? I think we have tried this uh, before. Yes, but the literature with micropulse laser trabeculoplasty is very variable. It depends on the wavelength of the machine that you're using. And it's, um, I, I mean, in our hands, I mean, when, when we tried the machine we had at Castrolaini, it, with, in, in my hands, it did not it did not give very good results. So I I can't really um, there aren't any randomized clinical trials conducted that would give me something solid to to report on. But yes, there is very very variable very variable. Some reported very good uh, results with the argon uh, type and um, uh, the uh, others uh, with wavelength. Sorry, four hundred and um, uh, 60s and uh, but others reported very poor results with wavelength of 810 so it depends yes yes interesting uh, another po uh, point though that i observed in practice that sometimes the patients respond uh, weeks after the treatment so that after treatment we do not expect an immediate response and then we modify the treatment we need to send the patient for a while and then recheck I think we need to wait for three months before putting any further decisions for management because a lot of patients, they are late uh, responders. Yes, yes. Uh, and we, we yes. actually, we, we, we do not redo the laser, not before six months of, of the first one. So we do not try to repeat it. Yeah. And that's a great. Rasha, thank you very much. That was really great. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now it's my pleasure.
to uh, introduce, and no need for introduction, Dr. Ahmad uh, Mustafa Abdurrahman, my professor and my mentor in glaucoma. He is the one who took my hand and just helped me all the way through with glaucoma. Dr. Ahmad is going to review the surgical intervention in primary open angle glaucomas, uh, evidence-based. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, please. Tasha, thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction. Thank you very, very much. Now, I will try to go through the surgical intervention in primary open uh, angle glaucoma. Uh, now, this is the situation where the angle is really open. Then when to operate, the question is that when the intraocular pressure cannot be maintained by non-surgical therapies at levels that are low enough to, present, to prevent further pressure-related damage of the optic nerve or the visual field. The actual three indications or the classes of indications when there is inadequate control of the intraocular pressure or there is a progressive damage despite apparently normal intraocular pressure or there is non-adherence to therapy. And a good point here that the response to the drug diminishes each time you add a drug so that reaching the maximum tolerated therapy does not mean you have to use every class of anti-glaucoma drugs. No, this is not the situation. For example, if you have used uh, two to three uh, products and then you can see the pressure is in the 30s, so that you don't expect a greater response with adding further drops. Now, just trying to put a graph uh, for everything available nowadays because there are many uh, surgical options and many opinions and uh, definitely supporters for each technique. Let me just try to classify. If the patient is still in the non-refractory phase, it means this is the first surgery, or the patient can be in the refractory phase, which means that he had a surgery which failed, or the patient sustained further failures. So if the patient is just fresh without previous surgery, we can go for trabeculectomy, non-penetrating surgery, and MIGS. And then if the patient is refractory, then we can think of glaucoma drainage devices and cycloablation. And then if the patient got further failure, we can think, shall we redo valve or shall we switch to cycloablation or vice versa? And then what's the impact of cataract surgery or the glaucoma control? And these are the two common, the classic robust operations we know in glaucoma for quite a long time. The right here is deep sclerectomy, and the left is trabeculectomy. And both operations, we start by dissection of a scleral flap and application of anti-metabolites, the same in both techniques, because deep sclerectomy is an external filtering operation. Then before trabeculectomy, we tend to put pre-placed sutures to prevent sudden um, or prolonged hypotony. And then we cut at the periphery of the cornea and then we remove part of the periphery of the cornea using keyless punch. And then we suture the surgical site and we reform it through the paracentesis. And here we have reached at the end of non-penetrating surgery where we have dissected a deep flap and we can see the percolation. So again, with deep sclerectomy, the anterior chamber is not opened and there is no, um, uh, there is no peripheral iridectomy. Every operation will be evaluated in the light of safety and efficacy, and safety will go in the first place to the non-penetrating surgery because we did not open the eye, and efficacy, trabeculectomy might be slightly superior to non-penetrating surgery, but the difference is not great. So if we think of this comparison, the non-penetrating surgery has a more uh, difficult, steep learning curve. The intraocular pressure, there might be superior IOP control with trabeculectomy, but that difference is really minimal. And then with the other complications regarding the hypotony-related complications, cataract progression, and long-term complications from the blood, they are all more with trabeculectomy and very, very minimal for the non-penetrating surgery to the extent that it's quite rare to find a case of endophthalmitis after non-penetrating surgery. There are lots of systematic reviews in this uh, area, and the, uh, the, those are some of the systematic reviews, and they actually stated that non-penetrating surgery is definitely much more superior regarding the safety, while trabeculectomy might be 
slightly superior regarding the efficacy. And there is one of the uh, here of the uh, uh, systematic reviews by our friend, uh, Dr. Ildali. He found out that with the um, adjusting the, 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 the final uh, data from the published controlled clinical trials, he found that uh, there is no way to say that one procedure is superior to the other, especially when you consider the qualified success. They are more or less similar to each other. That's quite a good point. And then these are some of the complications which we can see, like the ischemic blood, endothelmitis, and the effect of hypotony that could happen with a penetrating surgery and long-term problems. And then, so that here I have covered this region of trabeculectomy and non-penetrating surgery. Now let us go for MIGS because every now and then we hear about MIGS everywhere nowadays. Then MIGS procedure are definitely group of surgeries growing every other day, characterized by high safety and minimal disruption to the ocular anatomy, mostly ab internal approach. And they are usually having an efficacy which is almost more than 20% IOP reduction. And they are easier than the standard procedures might be, but definitely some of them are um, even much more difficult. And the procedure are generally the most common in the, those attacking the trabecular meshwork because this is the site of the disease. So we need to bypass the trabecular meshwork, whether by stent, stent placement like the eye stent or the hydrus implant or the eye stent where there is additional prostaglandin. We can excise the trabecular meshwork like the dual, uh, the Kahoot dual uh, blade the trabecotome GAT procedure, or we can enhance the flow through the trabecular meshwork by some other means. And we have the uh, supracoroidal implants, and Cypass is no more available, and it's now being replaced by the Minijet, which is coming to the market, subconjunctiva with the famous gel, uh, Zen gel implant and in focus, and also endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation is considered one of the MIGS uh, procedure. And then this is the GAT procedure we just, uh, and the GAT, you know, we are very familiar with the GAT. It is the Goldman Apparition Tonometry, or sometimes applies to that, uh, uh, the global uh, uh, assembly of uh, tariffs and the trade. So that we introduce the, uh, we cut the trabecular meshwork and we introduce the suture circumferentially proline 5.0. Mix are generally indicated with a mild to moderate glaucoma, and especially when added to phaco emulsification, there are huge increase in the percentage of publication in the recent years regarding the MIGS procedure. And let me go back to 2017 where there was a, a systematic review evaluating the MIGS and at that time actually the conclusion that uh, yes, they are efficient and safe, but still they mostly come from non-comparative uh, studies. And then when we move on to 2018, uh, when they have uh, tried to find out uh, studies evaluating the subconjunctival mix in the first place and the results here that no highly qualified evidence for the subconjunctival mix. And then there was a comment from the American Academy of Thermology was uh, regarding a publication in the uh, Journal of Glaucoma that actually uh, there is some problem with the publications of mix that the substantial proportion do not adhere to the world glaucoma association guidelines with lack of controlled clinical trials in relation to trabeculectomy, and there is some industrial push in this uh, region. So in another one in 2020, and then there is um, a need for high quality independent funded and performed uh, procedures to properly evaluate for the benefits of the doctors and the patients. Now, uh, w w there is an interesting um, article which is uh, about MIGS, is MIGS uh, a poor substitute to trabeculectomy or not? That was a great debate. And then for the motion that were supporting that trap and uh, they are really um, think that MIGS are poor substitute to trabeculectomy, the following are the points that trabeculectomy is turned 50 so in 2018 so that I'm a slightly older than the birth uh, date of trabeculectomy. And trabeculectomy is best, the best performed biological valve, cheap, and definitely um, long-term results are really documented. You know about that. 
and then it is the only procedure which can get the pressure down to 10 or even less. And then uh, if you say that MIGs do not require a post-operative care, this is not true. 50% require some uh, post-operative manipulations. And then sometimes you need to insert one to two MIGs in order to reduce the, the performance of trabeculectomy down to 50%. And the effect is sometimes dependent on the FACO. And the trabeculectomy is the best fit and forget option. Interesting. Let's go for those who are supporting MIGs. Uh, that uh, MIGs actually they are treating the pathology. Uh, trabeculectomy just diverts the fluid to the subconjunctival space while MIGs they treat the pathology. And the standalone MIGs are effective, fast visual recovery and uh, safety profile. And definitely, if we go to the old question that TRAB or not TRAB, that is not this, uh, the, uh, the, the question nowadays. We have something in between. And not every patient requires a pressure of 10. Uh, I found an interesting say to uh, uh, Ike Ahmed, which is the biggest uh, proponent for the MIGs. He said something which is quite interesting, that MIGs are often used earlier in glaucoma treatment algorithm. And a common uh, misperception of MIGs that it has to be compared with the gold standard of mitomycin trabeculectomy to show its effectiveness. This inappropriate interpretation is based on the idea that MIGS procedures are designed to replace conventional filtering surgery. In fact, MIGS are designed to address the treatment gap that exists between medical therapy and more aggressive traditional surgical option. That's really quite interesting, say, in this region, so that I changed my uh, algorithm to be like that for patients with mild to moderate disease, there is still a chance for MIGS. And then when we move to uh, a more established conditions and advanced, then we will go for the more robust uh, operations. And then um, you know that uh, we will go now uh, into the valves from the Maltino uh, to the left and uh, Ahmed Mateen to the right. And then these are the available drainage devices, you know, that could be valved implants and the most common is Ahmed valve with different shapes and types and materials. And we have the non valve implants with uh, barbels on top. These are the two common implants available. And also Maltino uh, is coming back with the Maltino 3. The insertion of the implants depends on the principle that we need to shift the fluid from the uh, anterior chamber to a reservoir around the uh, plate and then uh, the fluid will move uh, through the capsule that will be formed around the plate, and the plate is sutured almost uh, post-equatorial, so that we shift the fluid uh, to the, almost to the back of the eye. And now this is the uh, barbell-like uh, plate, uh, and we need to suture the tube because it is non-valved. We cannot leave it like that, otherwise we will get severe hypotony in the early post-operative period, and then we will cut the tube, uh, as uh, the desired length, and then we will penetrate the anterior chamber uh, away from the cornea, and we will uh, insert the tube. Uh, now the same thing is applied when it comes to Ahmed valve, but Ahmed uh, is a valved implant, so there is a valve which regulates the pressure flow through the valve. Now there is a big study which called the TVT study. What is the TVT study? It tried to study patients who underwent previous trabeculectomy, now they are in need of further intervention. And those patients were randomized into two groups, whether to receive barbell implants versus re trabeculectomy And in this situation, actually, the pressure reduction was a bit comparable, but the probability of failure was more in the trabeculectomy group. So they came up with the conclusion that the valves, they do better on patients already having failed trabeculectomy. And then based upon that, they have tried to move forward with the valves to place them as a first option and not to wait for trabeculectomy to fail. And that was the study called PTVT, which is the primary tube versus trabeculectomy. And actually with this study, the trabeculectomy achieved a lower target intraocular pressure. So still trabeculectomy, the golden standard, uh, especially in the primary intervention. Uh, and then there are many comparisons and meta-analysis comparing Ahmed to Barvelt, and actually they behave the same, but Barvelt is associated with more hypotony in the early post-operative period. So now when it comes to that refractory phase, 
with the glaucoma drainage devices, I have discussed the TVT, and then there was a wish to move forward by comparing to trabeculectomy, but I think trabeculectomy is the winner nowadays, except in the hands of the very experienced persons with the glaucoma drainage devices. Now let us move to the rest of the options of cycloablation. They are indicated primarily after failure of trabeculectomy. So again, it is just a refractory phase of the disease. And what's happening nowadays is there is huge improvement in the technology of cycloablation, starting from cyclocryotherapy, now covering a greater range of, uh, of modalities, including the micropulse, which you see right now, or the uh, high intensity uh, focused ultrasound, so that there is a huge improvement in that technology with the aim of trying to get the cycloablation as the first line of therapy. But actually, when it comes to reviewing the literature, insufficient data supporting this. Insufficient data doesn't, doesn't mean that the procedure is bad. No, still insufficient data with the recruitment of patients to make sure that it is safe to move to have those, uh, the cycloablation at the first line of therapy. Then there was some comparison here between patients with refractory glaucoma. Shall we go for, uh, cyclo, for cycloablation or glaucoma drainage devices? That was the big question. I found one study in 2006 that compared the double plate Maltino to cycloablation, and the comparison was in favor of double plate Maltino. Really, that was in 2006. I did not find anything significant since that time. And then when it comes to cataract surgery, just this is a very important piece of information because with angle closure glaucoma, cataract reduces the intraocular pressure dramatically, but with open angle glaucoma, it is just 2.7 millimeters. So you need to think about that. And this is one of my patients. He was referred actually after having his FACO and he was on full treatment of anti-glaucoma medications and received only FACO. What happened is aggravation of the glaucoma in the early post-operative period. So that you need to select your patients with open angle glaucoma who are expected to benefit from the FACO only, not adding a, a glaucoma operation at the same time. Remember the, the limited number of IOP reduction. Now, if we think of the glaucoma disease is like a funnel like that, so that if a patient with mild disease as we see to the left, we still have all options are working, but those patients usually we start with medications and SLP, we are still having a, a nice uh, long time to make uh, decent decisions regarding any surgical intervention. Now, if it happens that the patient now progressed to the moderate disease, now we have all the options, medications, SLP, glaucoma surgery, and here still MIGS can be applied in patients with mild to moderate disease. But at, as we move to advanced disease, and here we have only to use the robust operations. And the two robust operations, mitomycin trabeculectomy or mitomycin non-penetrating glaucoma surgery or with implants, and in the hands of experienced people with the glaucoma drainage devices, sometimes they go as the first option. But again, there is no role for MIGS in the patients with a very advanced disease. They need a low intraocular pressure for quite long period of time. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. That is just an excellent presentation as usual. Uh, you have wrapped everything up uh, clearly and nicely. So I actually don't have a lot. I actually don't have questions from the audience, which is, uh, which tells that everybody is happy with the, with the explanation provided. But um, yes, I'm, I'm just checking one more time, one last time. Is there any questions? Yes, and... I think we uh, I can ask I you a question until, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I uh, see, I see well, a question. My question for... Okay, great. Okay. Okay, I, I have a question here. Should we use surgical intervention for moderate cases or medical? You know, Rasha, the decision is not only, uh, the, 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 there are many factors behind that because if you are having a moderate disease and the pressure is still not controlled so that you can have a patient with moderate visual feed loss and moderate damage to the optic nerve, but the pressure is not controlled with medications 
or the patient is not adherent to the medication. So still in the patients with moderate disease. And I think those are the best candidates for operation actually, because working on the patients with advanced disease is full of risk and distresses to the patient and to the surgeon actually. Okay. Yasmin, you had a question for Dr. Ahmed? Yeah, I had two questions, in fact. Uh, so uh, my, my first question to Dr. Ahmed, would you consider primary tubes uh, in any of your patients? Uh, and the second question is for patients with failed trabeculectomy, Dr. Ahmed, would you go back and consider doing, uh, we discussed SLT, but maybe uh, some sort of mix uh, before escalating to doing uh, tubes? Uh, is there any situation where you, you would consider that? Now, the point is that for the first question, uh, I will not go for a valve as a primary procedure, definitely. I will go, I will give the chance for um, the procedures that uh, we learn uh, by heart and we know them uh, to the best so that I think I will not go for a valve in a primary case at all. Uh, I mean a primary, not a secondary glaucoma, of course, yes. Then for the second part, um, after three dystrobicolectomy that I just have heard from some of my colleagues that they have tried to do GAT with the inferior um, angle and it worked with them. But for myself, I think if I have a failed dystrobicolectomy, then I will just work on my trap to make it not uh, to fail, of course, by needling and so forth. But if the patient presented with a failure, usually the pressure is quite high that the SLT will not be uh, the option in those patients so that I either uh, will do uh, go for medications as well because I respect very well the medications because they are really very handy and can help you with the field cases and then if you are compelled to do surgery I think um, now you are in between the the modern cycloablation because I like so much the uh, micro pulse and high intensity focus uh, ultrasound, I think they are easily uh, applied and can be repeatable uh, rather than going for a uh, tube. I think I may go for a tube if the patient is too young. I may go for a tube in the first place. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, there's also one question here about the use of micropulse diode as a first option treatment in some cases or do you only reserve it for refractory cases? You know what's happened that I, as I see that every line of treatment wants to go up, go up for one line so that a patient receiving medical treatment, there is a study which compared treatment versus no treatment. And then when it comes to laser, laser was next to treatment. Then there was a study which has tried to compare the laser versus the medical treatment. And then the valves, they have tried to go up and push trabeculectomy and take its place. So that I, I see every management option wants to move, move up for one line. And that's happening at the same time with the cycloablation. But what's happening with cycloablation with the micropulse, uh, we have used this on patients with refractory glaucoma with a reasonable results. Um, we have got, uh, you know that every procedure needs a, a bit of time to digest and to get the best out of it. So what's happening now, I feel our results with the micropulse are much better than before. And that's why we are having an MD work registered in Cairo, uh, in Cairo University, um, uh, evaluating the micropulse as a primary therapy in patients with primary open angle of coma. Let's see uh, what will happen with that. I have one last question, which is why we do not go for needling in failed subscleral trabeculectomy or um, uh, and DS with gonioponcture uh, before we think of doing another surgery? Actually, you can... Is, you, know, you know, Russia, this is a million dollar question because the point is when you say trabeculectomy, trabeculectomy is a package. When you say non deep sclerectomy, deep sclerectomy is a package. When you say valve, valve is a package, which means after trabeculectomy, if the pressure goes up, you have means to go. And then if the pressure goes down, you have means to go. With the deep sclerectomy, if the pressure goes up, I can go for gonio-puncture and even external needling. If the valve with the pressure, so that you do not surrender after the, 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 you will get the best out of your procedure. But the problem is that when you receive a patient at your clinic who had trabeculectomy like done 10 years ago, and now it's failure. It doesn't look wise that you will go for needling of these operations. But if you do 
of an operation, please work on your operation to the end to make su successful. And then we might move to another question. How many needlings should I go before I decide that the procedure is a failure? It's a, a failure. question, that a minimum of three needlings, of course. So that is not, not just to do an operation and then to move to the next, that will be a terrible life, of course. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much Thank for you. the enlightening uh, answers for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Riham Sami. Uh, Dr. Riham Sami will talk about a very, very interesting topic, which we think ask uh, all the time, which is neuroprotection in glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Riham, we are all ears. Um. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, introduction. Uh, and I will introduce, uh, and I will talk about the basic concepts of neuroprotection, trying to be as simple as possible. First of all, starting with some definitions, we have to differentiate two terms: neuroprotection and neuroregeneration. By neuroprotection, we refer to the use of any therapeutic modality that can prevent the death of uh, retinal ganglion cells that already occur due to a primary lesion. In other words, prevention of the death of the remaining existing retinal ganglion cells after the primary insult. However, in neuroregeneration, it refers to any strategy that can stimulate regrowth of an already injured retinal ganglion cell. To sim simplify things, if we have a patient with early open angle glaucoma as such, he has got structural and functional losses. If we follow up this patient and succeeded to maintain the same losses, this is neuroprotection. However, if we succeeded to make the lost function and structure come back again, this is what we mean by neuroregeneration. We all know that glaucoma is a multifactorial disease. And we have uh, two defiable risk factors, which is the pressure-induced mechanical damage and the decreased blood flow either as a consequence or as a cause for glaucoma. So these factors already, uh, are, we, are, we have already some tools to manage. However, some other notorious factors exist uh, that can lead to a patient with an apparently normally controlled intraocular pressure to have progression. And therefore, the number 21 has disappeared from the definition of glucometers optic neuron. When I thought where well, to start the story of neuroprotection, simply we have logically to start with the target. Our target cell is the retinal ganglion cell. We have to ask our, ourselves why is this cell in particular susceptible to glucometers damage and how does this damage occur? And so what are the tools available to modulate this? When we look at the retinal ganglion cells, the retinal ganglion cells start a long journey. The cell body is present in the retina, and then a very long single axon travels all the way, all through the visual pathway to the lateral geniculate body as a single axon. And therefore, this cell is susceptible to insult because it has the largest axon to soma ratio of all the retinal cells. And this cell is also living in a hostile environment of relative hypoxia. The oxygen tension surrounding the retinal ganglion cell is from 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, and this is a highly metabolically active cell, and so uh, uh, it is surviving in a hostile extracellular milieu. And it is also bathed in a high concentration of ascorbate, which can react with some uh, free radicals or some, some elements to form uh, notorious uh, compounds that can further insult them. So damage can occur at the level, at any level of the retinal ganglion cell, starting from the cell body of the soma and along the axon all through. This occurs naturally, uh, loss, loss of the retinal ganglion cells can occur naturally all over our lives, but at a very slow rate, so that we cannot um, experience any functional deterioration. However, in glaucoma, we have accelerated loss of the retinal ganglion cells and hence visual impairment and visual deterioration can occur. We have two patterns of cell death. Cells can die by necrosis or murder, and this mandates the presence of an external uh, killer, or, um, such as an infection uh, or a, a trauma, and this is not the case in glaucoma. However, in glaucoma, retinal ganglion cells die by apoptosis or a programmed cell death, and it is the, the cell that decides when to follow. Also, the axons experience energy deficits that can lead to an anterograde and retrograde uh, losses uh, at the level of the cell body and at the level of the axonal trans, uh, transmission and leads to further the, uh, loss of the retinal ganglion cells. 
we have to ask ourselves another question. Why is the damage or the glucometer's damage progressive? In other words, if you have a patient with controlled intraocular pressure, why do you still follow up your patient? Are you expe experiencing or are expecting further deterioration despite an apparently normal pressure? Yes. We have, can imagine or can group the retinal ganglion cells into three categories. The first type of cells are very healthy and very strong. They can stand uh, notorious elements, they, this, and this we can see in ocular hypertensive patients. Sometimes they have a high pressure, but the retinal ganglion cells can resist and no losses are present. On the other hand, some of the retinal ganglion cells, when they are exposed to the elevated intraocular pressure, they die immediately and they are terminated. Uh, not uh, 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 in a third category exists, which are the vulnerable ganglion cells. These are cells which have borderline, uh, borderline uh, susceptibility to damage. They are not as strong as these and are not terminated to death like these. And these are uh, the, the retinal ganglion cells which we are focusing on to protect from further damage. We can imagine that a primary insult occurred and this primary insult is followed by a secondary insult. The retinal ganglion cells are living in a hostile extracellular milieu and it is our uh, function or our uh, aim to try to resuscitate these dying ganglion cells and prevent the further loss. So we can classify neuroprotection according to the type of, of the agent into direct neuroprotective agent which acts directly to maintain health of the retinal ganglion cells and indirect uh, neuroprotection by means of intraocular pressure reduction, that, like the anti glaucoma treatments, optimizing optic nerve head perfusion, or some alternative therapy like the natural therapy and the exercises, which can boost uh, the immunity of the retinal ganglion cells. What in our hands is the intraocular pressure reduction, as we reduce the effects related to high pressure, and we can perfuse, reperfuse the optic nerve head, and some of the anti glaucoma medications have got some direct neuroprotective action, as we will see later on. Now I will focus on this uh, zone, the direct uh, neuroprotection, in particular the chemical modulation. Trying to understand this, when we want to create a direct neuroprotective agent, this agent should have a receptor on its target cell, which is the retinal ganglion cell, and it should reach the retina and vitreous in pharmacologically sufficient doses. Also, this drug should trigger pathways that enhance the resistance and boost immunity to the retinal ganglion cells to, to sustain insult uh, that occur due to high pressure. And we should have documented clinical trials in order to start using this agent. Okay, this is a retinal ganglion cell living in a normal uh, situation. Normally, we have some form of retrograde transmission of neurotrophins from the axon of the retinal ganglion cell to the cell body, and these are essential for the nutrition and the survival of the, of the retinal ganglion cell itself. Also, there is continuous reuptake of a neurotransmitter, an excitatory neurotransmitter known as glutamate, from the synaptic junction back to the cell axon. What happens if this retinal ganglion cell is insulted or is injured? There is no more retrograde transmission of the neurotrophins and glutamate will be existent in very high concentrations in the extracellular uh, environment. And this high level of glutamate have got a receptor on this retinal ganglion cell. The most famous is the N-methyl D-aspartate receptors. And the combination of both will result into influx of high doses of calcium into the cell. And this calcium uh, influx will uh, activate some nucleases or some enzymes that can lead to the ultimate damage and death of this retinal ganglion cell. Also, uh, there will be a, a present of free radicals, um, and the most, uh, most famous of them is the superoxide, which can uh, react with the nitrous oxide to form more notorious agents. Also, there is activation of some caspases, and these proteins aid in the influx of more calcium into the cell, and hence we end by a dead retinal ganglion cell or a lost retinal ganglion cell. If we want to perform true neuroprotection, we should counteract these mechanisms. And we, should, uh, we, can, we can imagine that we, we need neurotrophins. We need to inhibit uh, the nitrous oxide sensitase to block its reaction with the um, uh, free radicals. We can antagonize glutamate, block the calcium channels, and uh, give antioxidants, like uh, uh, and some of the antioxidants, like the coenzyme Q and the ginkgo biloba. We have already two drugs that are available in the market. We have the remonidine eye drops, and these have got a NEMDA receptor. Uh, they, they can block the NMDA receptor by 
um, binding to it, and so they block the, uh, the influx of calcium, and also memantine, which is a drug used in Alzheimer's disease. Also, in the market re recently, there is the release of the rokinase inhibitors, and these rokinase inhibitors can increase the blood flow and modulate the axonal life of the retinal ganglion cells, so they can promote axonal regeneration, and this have been, uh, uh, some clinical trials are being uh, conducted on this. The alternative medicine have got its role, like the Jinko biloba, the Chinese medical herbal uh, medicines, the green tea and the melatonin have got some chance. However, if we have a glance through evidence-based medicine, we will find that there are, we don't have this paucity of information and there is a literature gap regarding neuroprotection studies. And only two studies existing, uh, the, uh, one of them is uh, evaluating the alpha-2 agonists and another one evaluating the memantine, and both of them have a very low level of evidence. Why is this present? Or why is conducting a clinical trial for neuroprotection difficult? Simply because we are not answering our study question. We have some data, we, we have some patients who with elevated pressure do not develop glaucoma, or are on the opposite, low tension glaucoma, or some patients who are progressing despite a controlled intraocular pressure. However, we have discrepancy between what's found in vivo and what's found in vitro studies. Also, we are indirectly monitoring our patients. We are depending on visual fields and OCTs. We are not seeing the retinal ganglion cells itself. But recently, uh, there is an immunofluorescent technology known as the drug or the direct um, uh, the, di the, the detection of apoptotic retinal ganglion cells. And this can uh, let us see the, the actual effect on the drug on retinal ganglion cell survival. So it's hoping that this opens the door for cell therapy by injecting intravitreal leading chimal cells or by injecting recom or using recombinant human nerve fiber uh, growth factors or by even by gene therapy. Okay, to sum up what I said, we have two types of neuroprotection, the direct and the indirect. And in the indirect one, we can reduce the intraocular pressure or optimize perfusion, as well as some of the direct anti-glaucoma uh, uh, patients, uh, some of the anti-glaucoma which have direct neuroprotective effects like the uh, brimonidine and the roclatan or the kinase inhibitors, some like the memantine and some of the traditional medicines like the green tea and the melatonin. And thank you for your, uh, for your uh, attention. Uh, Riham, thank you very much. Uh, very tough topic. Very, very, thank you very, very much. So that uh, just uh, may I ask you in your practice, uh, do you uh, use um, neuroprotection as a routine uh, uh, concept in the management of every patient or how do you think about that for uh, implementing into the practice? Okay, um, not in every patient I can uh, put this as a fundamental role, but most of the anti-glaucoma uh, have got some uh, neuroprotective effect apart from the beta blockers. These are the only proven drugs that can reduce the perfusion of the optic nerve head. However, uh, we can think of the patient as a whole. If the patient has any predisposing factor to reduction of the blood flow, I will um, search for the cause and I will try to correct his systemic condition. However, I'm not uh, with the use of some systemic medications like memantine, for example, to, to, to control my glaucoma. I have to control the, the target, the, um, the pressure itself, and then I will evaluate if there is progression despite this. I can search for the cause and, and then uh, search for the neuroprotective agents. Uh, thank you very much, Riham. That's really great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your lecture. Uh, now, may I invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Rasha Munir, to take over for the second session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. I know uh, we've been running really late, so we'll try to keep our second part uh, to the minimum. We'll try to stick to um, be doing it really fast. And uh, in this part, we, um, we have case-based management cases um, and their um, relation to the evidence. And case one, uh, can, may I please invite Dr. Hebe Magdi and Dr. Fairuz Abulazayim to uh, start the case uh, entitled, Does the Patient Have Glaucoma? Okay, thank you, Dr. Rashid. Um, uh, our presentation or our case is about the dilemma of diagnosing patient being glaucomatous or not, and that uh, what uh, what we will know at the end of the presentation. Our case is about a 26 years old male patient. He was complaining of itching in both eyes, and he had LASIK surgery two years ago. 
and he gives history that his mother has glaucoma and been uh, on anti-glaucoma for about uh, 10 uh, years. Uh, on examination, he has visual acuity of 6.6 in both eyes, and tear segment examination showed fine papillary conjunctivitis. The intraocular pressure was 10 in the right eye, 12 in the left eye. Gonioscopy revealed open angle in both eyes with normal structure of both angles. Uh, and fundus examination revealed a bilateral covering in both eyes. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Hippa, what do you think of this case? Uh, is he glucometous? Okay, let's first take a deep look on the optic disc fairways. Do you think these optic discs are symmetrical? Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, the cupping is more in the left eye. Uh, it's more advanced, and uh, there is superior notch and very papillary uh, changes appear in the left eye. Yes, exactly. Uh, so what I are could be the possibilities? I think this patient might either have normal tension glaucoma or could be juvenile open angle glaucoma with pressure spikes, or let's hope this will be just a physiological cupping. But since we are dealing with a myopic patient with history of LASIK surgery, we are expecting to have a thin cornea with expected false low intraocular pressure reading by the Goldman applanation tonometer. So first of all, we have to assess the central corneal thickness. We also have to assess the corneal compensated intraocular pressure. And of course, IOP phasing should be essentially uh, done to detect any intraocular pressure spike. All of these just to get the real intraocular pressure of our patient. I want to ask you, what have you done to that patient so far? Okay, uh, the central corneal thickness was uh, 470 microns in the right eye and 450 micro microns in the left eye. Uh, or it was done uh, to get the corneal compensated intraocular pressure and it was obtained in both eyes. Uh, also, phasing was done and uh, the, um, the intraocular pressure ranged from um, uh, 15 to 18 in the right eye and 17 to 20 in uh, the left eye. Hmm. Um, uh, what about the visual field test uh, to assess the function of this optic nerve? Okay, we did visual field and the visual field goes completely normal with normal uh, uh, total deviation and pattern uh, deviation and the glaucoma hem hemifield test goes within the normal limit. So he's not glaucomatous? Actually, in spite of this normal visual field, the possibility of glaucoma is still present. He might have the pre premetric glaucoma. Don't forget that uh, for the visual field, the changes to appear, we need more than 20% of the ganglion cells to be lost. And here comes the rule of the OCT in the detection of the early glaucomatous changes. Um, have you, the OC, have you a, an available OCT for that patient? For the yes. I did him an optic nerve with OCT and the death topography was completely normal and also the ganglion cell complex was uh, completely normal in both eyes. Okay, so now we are dealing with a patient with bilateral asymmetrical uh, large cup with normal intraocular pressure with no pressure spikes and normal visual field as well as normal retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cells by the OCT. So we can conclude that this patient is not a glaucomatous, he is just a glaucoma suspect. But who is the glaucoma suspect, Ferus? Uh, okay, glaucoma suspect patient, according to uh, reviewing the guidelines, uh, the American Academy guidelines are a person with normal angles in both eyes and has one of the following criteria, either appearance of the optic nerve head or retinal nerve fiber layer that is suggestive of glaucomatous damage or presence of visual field abnormality consistent with glaucoma or an elevated intraocular pressure more than 21 millimeter mercury. And in our case, the suspicious, uh, uh, he's glaucoma, glaucoma suspect because of the appearance of the optic nerve of the retina nerve fiber layer. And I listed yes. many uh, of the risk factors uh, of this glaucoma suspect patient to develop primary open angle glaucoma. And the most important of which was the high intraocular pressure and uh, the positive the family history and thinner cornea. Uh, myopia, large cup to this ratio, and tied to diabetes. And in our patient, uh, he has positive family history of glaucoma. He is myope because he did LASIK for myopia, and he has large cup to this ratio and uh, thin cornea. Okay, but this cornea in this patient might be just induced by the LASIK surgery. Do you have any idea about the, the central corneal thickness before the LASIK surgery? Uh, yes, uh, this was the central corneal thickness prior, prior to surgery. The, the cornea was 500 
uh, 10 microns in the right eye and um, 504 microns in um, uh, the left eye. So he had thin cornea. Yeah, um, the cornea is originally thin from the start and this can reflect yes. the behavior of the whole outer coat of this eye, including the lamina cribrosa. So thin cornea, yes, is added to the risk factors in, in this patient, yes. Uh, and hence uh, come the, the most important question, should we treat this patient or not? Okay, our patient is a high risk glau glaucoma suspect, but actually I will not start anti-glaucoma treatment now, as there is no real evidence of having glaucoma yet. His intraocular okay. pressure is normal with no spikes. He, uh, both the function and the structure of the optic nerve is normal, but actually this patient has to be followed up every six months because he has multiple risk factors to develop glaucoma. And in each visit, you have to check the corrected intraocular pressure, you have to check the optic uh, disc appearance, and I will also ask for new visual field, OCT, for the retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cells, as well as optic disc photography for better following up of the uh, optic nerve uh, uh, changes. And I will start treatment only if there is optic nerve deterioration detected by the OCT or in the optic disc photography, or if the pressure starts to rise, or if new visual field changes consistent with glaucoma starts to appear. But let's apply this to the guidelines failures. Uh, okay, uh, the guidelines, um, uh, the decision to treat a uh, glaucoma suspect patient if there is discovered an optic nerve deterioration, depending on the appearance of the optic nerve, the retinal nerve fiber layers, or the visual field loss, uh, or the presence of multiple important risk factors, or very high intraocular pressure, or the development of new visual field defect consistent with glaucoma when repeated. Uh, and according to the NICE guidelines, uh, uh, that's coincident with our patient uh, who had thin cornea. Uh, they decided to treat patient with less than uh, 555 microns only if the pressure is more than 21. And according to the follow-up uh, schedule for patients, our patient has multiple risk factors, but the pressure is controlled, so so he has to be followed up from six to 12 uh, months. Uh, and at any time, uh, there is optic nerve deterioration or elevated intraocular pressure. Uh, or development of visual field defect, this patient should be treated. Uh, and yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you, Heba. Thank you. A very clear message. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Now, the next case by Dr. Rasha El Tanamli and Dr. Iman Magdi just diagnosed. Uh, hi again, everyone. Um, so we uh, have a case. I would like to consult you, Dr. Rasha, about it. Uh, she's a female. Just a second. I'll share my screen. Uh, so a 47-year-old female uh, came for routine eye examination, and she wanted to do reading glasses as well. Her corrected visual acuity was 6'6", both eyes. Uh, the intraocular pressure by Goldman aplanation was 26 millimeters of mercury in the right eye and 28 uh, in the left. Uh, her fundus picture looked like that. Um, so as we can see, the, both optic discs. What do you think, Dr. Rasha? Well, um, for this patient, yes, she has uh, asymmetry in the cup and with a larger cup in the left eye. And um, she has definitely high intraocular pressure, 26 and 28 on first admins, uh, on first presentation. But I would like to know um, some more information, please, Ime. I mean, have you done um, central corneal thickness? Is there a family history? Is there, uh, how about the refraction? And did she do any um, gonioscopy? Uh, uh, exactly. So, uh, yes, uh, her central corneal thickness uh, was 542 microns in the right and 546 in the left. Her, uh, her sister is a glaucoma patient and she, her brother uh, is a suspect. Uh, so there is a positive family history and her refraction is rather emetropic, it, uh, nothing significant. Um, the Go gonioscopy, uh, the, the angle was open in all four quadrants in both eyes. Uh, and she hasn't had any ocular surgery or previous ocular medication or, or whatever. How, how about 
any investigations like field or OCT? Uh, yes, her field. Uh, this is her field. As we can see here, it, 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 there are early changes. The mean deviation is still in the early phase, minus two in the right and minus three in the left. Uh, we can see here uh, uh, some early inferior nasal, relative inferior nasal defects. Uh, they are more pronounced in the left eye. Um, so early field changes more in the left and the OCT was consistent with the field, still uh, also showing early changes. Uh, thinning of borderline significance here in the superior nasal quadrant, uh, thinning of the rim temporarily in the right eye, and absent rim in this zone in the inferior temporal and lateral uh, and the lower temporal zones in the left eye with significant thinning in the superior temporal quadrant. Um, so I think, uh, I think that um, puts the patient in the category of primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, she is not a suspect. She has a uh, positive family history, high intraocular pressure, consist, uh, f field and OCT changes with consistent, um, uh, consistent with the appearance of the optic nerve that is more glaucomatous changes, uh, more apparent on the left eye. So I would just simply diagnose a primary open angle glaucoma. So, so, so you will consider the. So you consider uh, this a recently diagnosed case, a fresh case yes. with no previous uh, medications, or uh, uh, it's a recently diagnosed case. How would you like to proceed, uh, Doctor Russia, based on the guidelines we all just mentioned? Well, um, based on the guidelines, we have two options. Uh, I would first counsel the patient. I mean, for a patient who is recently diagnosed, coming for glasses, and then finding out that she has something, a chronic disease, long-lasting medications, and uh, with the risk of loss of vision, um, that's a very traumatizing experience. So I need to go very slowly. I need to counsel the patient um, thoroughly and talk to her for a long time and give her all the options. The two options that I would talk uh, to her about are either starting with lasers in the form of SLT or going to uh, medical treatment in the form of prostaglandin analogues or beta blockers and these are the guidelines. Uh, of course we are not talking about argon laser trabeculoplasty anymore, it's so outdated now. So basically I'm just going to counsel and counsel, clearly explain the disease and explain the medications and explain the SLT with the side effects of the medications and the um, and I will really stress on the idea that the laser is not a lifelong cure. You just don't do the laser and pop out of the clinic and think you are cured. No, it still needs follow up. And I will go and again and again stress on the importance of the follow up. I will try to ask the patient questions um, to know about her, the pattern of life, her, the way uh, uh, she would be adherent or not to the medications. I mean, young patients who are very active, it's usually harder for them to uh, keep records of the medications and to maintain something like that. But And, and she is relatively 47, as I remember. Yes, yes and she was active. That, she's a working woman. Uh, yes. Uh, and exactly. that's... That's hard. I mean, for me, that's that's a hard option. So I will counsel the patient definitely about the two options. And I would personally go for SLT if the patient, uh, if the patient's lifestyle would uh, not allow compliance or adherence to medications. Okay, uh, so uh, that's what we actually did. The patient, uh, uh, we did the uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty for both eyes and the patient was followed up. Um, after SLT, the intraocular pressure uh, decreased to 15 millimeters of mercury in the right and 16 millimeters of mercury in the left eye. Uh, we followed the patients for two years and she was controlled. Uh, after two years, the pressure started to rise again um, to reach 20 millimeters of mercury uh, OU. Uh, at this point, Dr. Russia, would you treat or would you follow up more closely would you consider 20 to be okay or, uh, or wh what would you prefer to do? Well, uh, for that patient who started with 26 and 28, um, and she has actually achieved a very good drop 
with laser. I would look at her field and I would look at her OCT. If um, with the 20, I did not document any progression, either in the field or in the OCT, then I would do watchful follow-up. But if by any means or for any chance there I could document any deterioration, then I would offer her again two options of medications. I would offer her a, a repeat SLT or shifting to um, medications. Yes, and for, for how, how many times would you, uh, can we repeat SLT for a patient like this, for a freshly, for a patient who was freshly, was freshly diagnosed and who uh, underwent SLT only once? Uh, can we repeat it for how many times? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, we do not repeat SLT uh, before six months of duration from the first uh, session, uh, just to document that there is effect. If we have a good response, then it's very likely that a repetition of SLT will attain the same response uh, again. And um, we would, uh, if the patient did not uh, get a good response from the beginning, then we could wait till up to six months and then repeat the laser one more time. And this we would um, and reassess. Um, how many times overall should we repeat the laser? Um, you can repeat the laser at least twice after the initial uh, operation uh, or after the initial procedure. Uh, after that, it might not be as effective. The good thing about SLT that it is repeatable because it does not cause coagulative necrosis to the trabecular meshwork, um, unlike the old uh, argon laser trabecular plasty, which led to coagulative necrosis and with repetition, it led to peripheral anterior synechi formation. But that's not the case with SLT, so we can safely repeat it at least two more times. Um, and we again, we need to stress that the patient will have to uh, monitor uh, and follow up quite closely because the pressure is likely to drop again, and that's excellent, but in maybe a year or two, uh, it may likely rise. So if this happens after the repetition, then we need to shift to um, um, prostaglandin analogues or beta blockers according to um, the patient's systemic uh, disease or the systemic condition and if they, she has any uh, side effects or anything that would contraindicate either of the two medications. Okay, so the, this patient was actually counseled and she chose uh, to start start uh, a monotherapy, a single topical medical treatment uh, over a repetition of uh, SLT. The patient uh, started using a prostaglandin analog once daily and the pressure was maintained at 16 plus minus around 16 millimeters of mercury for more than 10 years now. So um, great. So uh, I guess that's another scenario for, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rasha, for your input on such a case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Iman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now. Okay, uh, now we have, allow me to. Uh, allow me to introduce Case number three now, which is the usual scenario. Um, the case will be presented by Dr. Mona Ahmed and uh, consulting Dr. Riham Sami in uh, about it. Please, can you please go ahead, Mona? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rasha. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, for uh, allowing me to participate in this event. Uh, I would like to share with you the usual scenario of a moderate primary open angle glaucoma at presentation, and I will be discussing this case with Dr. Iham Sami. Uh, our case is a 39 year old gentleman. He's coming for routine eye examination and glass prescription. His, his history is only significant for a family history of glaucoma in his, grandfa in his grandfather. Otherwise, history is negative. The best corrected visual acuity was 6 6 in each eye with a slight or moderate myopic refraction. Intraocular pressure at that time was 15 in the right eye and 20 in the left eye. This is how his optic discs looked on examination. Uh, Dr. Ihem, uh, what's your comment on this patient? 
Uh, Mona, you have a, a male patient who has got a risk, some risk factors for developing of glaucoma. He has a positive family history. He has a myopic refraction, and he has an, a, a widely variable intraocular pressure between the right and left eye. Uh, may I ask you at uh, the time you measured this intraocular pressure? It was at uh, 7 p.m. Okay. Uh, this is a point we will, I will mention to you later. Uh, he has some changes in his optic nerves. Both optic nerves show um, enlarged vertical cup to disc ratio with an inferior notch in the right eye and parapapillary atrophy in both eyes. So I would uh, suggest that you phase his intraocular pressure. You have to check his intraocular pressure in different times of the day. And I would like to know some information about his pachymetry and a baseline visual field and OCT should be ordered mm -hmm. because uh, I would like to know if there is structural or functional uh, damages as well. So uh, this has been done, as, as you say, Dr. Reham, uh, phasing of the intraocular pressure was, was done, revealing maximum intraocular pressure of 28 and minimum of, of 18 in the right eye and maximum IOP of 32 and minimum of 19 in meters mercury in the left eye. The central corneal thickness was 502 micrometers in the right eye and 495 in the left eye, measured by ultrasound pachymetry. The visual field and OCT were, were ordered, and uh, we will we'll see. Now, this is the visual field and OCT done for this patient. Uh, please comment, uh, Dr. Reham, on this visual field and OCT. Okay, uh, we have an evident structural damage in both eyes, and this is more profound in the left eye, as we see here many areas of, um, of, of, of um, borderline and significant thinning, as we can see here in the right eye. This is an area of borderline thinning with corresponding uh, functional deficit in the field. And also in the left eye, there is much more extensive zones of loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer with an early inferior arcuate scotoma in the visual field. Uh, is this the first field for the patient, Yamona? No, this is not the first field. We actually did uh, two, two fields, and this is the third one. We discarded the first two for the learning effect, and this, is, this one is with very good reliability in this, so I included it in this presentation. Okay, perfect. Then we have an evident case of early, post, uh, of early open angle glaucoma in the right eye and moderate open angle glaucoma in the left eye. So what is the management at this stage? What options for, of treatment uh, do we have? Okay, we have many options, Yamona, but the most important thing is you have to counsel your patient. As Dr. Arasha said, it is usually a trauma for the patient to hear that he has a, got a chronic disease and it can cause him visual impairment. So we have to discuss and counsel the, with the patient about the nature of his disease and about the significance of treatment. Notice that Dr. Dr. Rehan, I'm sorry, can you open your video, please? We can't see you. Uh -huh. It's open, Dr. Arasha. Uh, your camera, your camera, uh, camera. Your camera, yes. Yes. Okay. No, 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 not yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now we can see it clearly. Yes. Thank you. I guess you will yes. see me in a moment. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, okay. After counseling of the patient, uh, uh, bearing into mind that we have an asymptomatic disease and so the patient is not feeling visual deterioration. This is number one. Number two, we have to, to instruct the patient that we can start a monotherapy. Uh, and in this essence, I will suggest a prostaglandin look. Or I can uh, start with selective laser trabeculoplasty if the patient is not uh, comfortable with using uh, the medication. And then I have to explain the regimen for follow-up uh, later on. So counseling and patient education, medical therapy versus SLT, and the follow-up schedule uh, for this case. What have you done with the case, Simona? Uh, I counseled the patient. I told him about this diagnosis and uh, about the risk of visual loss uh, over time and about the need of continuous treatment and monitoring of the intraocular pressure and the structure and functional changes and the effect of this on his quality of life. Uh, I give him the, uh, the options of medical therapy versus CT, but at his preference, he preferred the medical therapy. So I prescribed a uh, 
prostaglandin analog, which is pravoprost, once before bedtime, in, and instructed the patient how to use his medications and the possible side effects of this medication, and give him the follow-up appointment after two weeks to check for the effect of treatment and for the adherence of patient to treatment. So what happened after this, that the patient disappeared from follow-up for more than six months. He came again after more than six months with an intraocular pressure of six, 26 in the right eye and 28 in the left eye. And he reported that he only used the medication for one month and then discontinues its treatment. So I ordered new visual field and OCT to detect any progression of the disease. Uh, he only performed the uh, OCT. He couldn't uh, perform an, an uh, accurate or reliable field. And this is the OCT. This is the new OCT compared to the previous one. Can compare it. Okay, we can see evidence structural progression, Imona, in this uh, in the new one. Um, we have uh, here in this area appearance of new zones of borderline thinning in the in the retinal nerve fiber layer, as as well as uh, the same thickness here, uh, and and in the on the other eye the same uh, appearance. We have more areas that deepened uh, the structural losses and entered from borderline to profound affection. So we have documented structural uh, damage. And this is expected in this stage in the disease. Uh, I ac accept or I appreciate that patients are usually, um, they, they usually don't like to repeat the visual field. They feel that it is something uh, very irritable for them. However, um, it's the only tool that reveals the function uh, of the retinal ganglion cells. In moderate diseases and in early diseases, whole, uh, thank God there is correlation, good correlation between the changes we see in structure and those seen in function. So we can rely on this OCT as a documented structural progression. So what is the next step now? How okay. would we manage this case? Okay, we, have, we are facing the non-compliant patient. And this non-compliance may be due to uh, the, the price of the, of the drug, maybe due to the in, inconvenience with the side effects, maybe due to the patient's nature of being non-compliant. So uh, we have an uncontrolled intraocular pressure as well and documented structural progression. So we have to, to do an intervention and we have ma many options in the early disease as, as Dr. Ahmed uh, show, have shown us, has shown us in his presentation. We have non-penetrating glaucoma surgeries, uh, subscleral trabeculectomy or selective laser trabeculoplasty. These are all options and each one have got its, uh, has got its pros and cons. What have you done, Yamona, for the patient? So after counseling the patient and uh, giving him the options and the complications and effects of everyone, he chose to do surgery and the, I selected to do uh, my uh, subsclear trabeculectomy with mitomycin, starting with the left eye, which is the more advanced or the eye with more change and higher uh, IOP. And I still following the patient now for, this is the photo after six weeks of surgery and his intraocular pressure in this eye is 10 on no treatment. Okay, what about his the second eye, uh, Yamona, the right eye? Have you performed an intervention for it? Uh, still not uh, operated, but I'm following the intraocular pressure and despite the patient is not very compliant still on his treatment, now the intraocular pressure is noticed to be uh, between 16 and 18 millimeters of mercury. And I don't know what is the explanation. No, the, 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 the explanation in literature that is something known as an ophthalmic consensual reaction. When you control the pressure in one eye, there is a cross effect on the other eye even after performing trabeculectomy. And I think you should follow up the other eye and document if um, progression occurs uh, by OCT and sure. visual field as well to have the decision for um, surgical intervention or you can convince him to start medical treatment. Anyone? And here are some reports from literature uh, that assist my, 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 uh, my opinion. So, the take home so, message. The take home message that evaluation of risk factors in history and examination of every patient is important to detect glaucoma at an earlier stage. In managing a case of established glaucoma, patient counseling and monitoring of adherence to treatment and control of IOP are essential. Intervention should not be delayed when there is an evidence of progression. There is an evidence that unilateral glaucoma surgery has an effect on IOP in the unoperated fellow eye. And thank you, Dr. Ehem, and thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank, 
Thank you, thank you so much, Mona. Thank you so much, Rehem, for the very informative presentation. Now to our final presentation, uh, we have um, the undesirable presentation. Um, Dr. Ahmad uh, Mustafa and Dr. Zainab Sanaberi will um, be presenting the case. Okay. Uh, finally, and <laughs> I think all are tired now, uh, but we will talk about the undesirable presentation of advanced glaucoma. Ahmed, I have a 60 years old man who has open angle glaucoma. His left eye has persistent raised IP of 30 millimeter mercury and hand motion vision with glaucomatous optic atrophy and total absolute field loss. I'm talking now about his right eye. His right eye is 12 millimeter mercury on various medications with CG ratio of 0.7, uh, knowing that he had trabeculectomies in both eyes. And the right field examination shows advanced field loss with a central island. And the patient is feeling that he has worsening in re recent years despite this pressure control. This is his uh, disc looking and the visual field using the size uh, 5. 24-2 and 10-2 and the kinetic perimetry and uh, the OCT with the floor effect and the total loss of ganglion cells. So is there a value of measuring the IUP at different date times for this patient, Ahmed? Yes, um, this is a very interesting case. Uh, one eye patients are in particularly very sensitive so that uh, the patient has reported recent uh, drop of vision. So is this, uh, this is due to uncontrolled glaucoma or due to something else like cataract, for example. So uh, if you are having a, a single reading of 12, this doesn't mean that the pressure is 12 uh, throughout the 24 hours. So uh, for a patient uh, like that, I think I need to go deep into the readings of the intraocular pressure uh, but the problem is that uh, the spikes of the pressure are usually uh, uh, in the morning, 7 a.m. in the morning, or 10 a.m. in the uh, in the evening, so that uh, they are outside the uh, the office hours. So that for the patient in particular, diurnal variation is a factor, and I think the recommendation is to take three readings of the intraocular pressure and take an average: one reading at 10 a.m. and the second at 2 p.m and the third at 6 p.m. so that the patient should come at different times. And then if the pressure is changing, th that's quite good to see. If the pressure is not changing, you still can ask the patient to come as early as he can or to leave as late as he can. And it's quite interesting for such patients also to have one of the readings while the patient is in the supine position. So that can give you an overall evaluation of his 12 because it is, um, it is very serious to have a patient who is deteriorating under a normal pressure. So maybe it's spikes that cause him this deterioration. Okay. Yeah, fluctuations, yes, maybe. Is there an addition, any additional investigation that you may ask for it to rule out any confounding pathology, for example? And actually for those patients, I ask of, about the systemic condition, in particular the blood pressure, if he's having any hypertension in particular or hypertension. So I would like to check that. Uh, and also I would like to have a good examination of the slit lamp for any evidence of uh, cataract, like posterior cortical cataract, especially that patient underwent trabeculectomy. And there is uh, an evidence that trabeculectomy is associated with higher incidence of complicated cataract, more than 50%, they get cataract with time. So that, uh, and also I would like to ask about uh, any neurological uh, symptoms uh, because, you know, if there is any affection of the central nervous system that would affect his uh, feeling of the field as well. Yes, of course, because he may had a small or a tiny vascular accident that affects him his vision centrally uh, and not detected. Yes. Uh, so sure. you have talked about the cataract. So maybe the cataract is a potential cause for his complaint. 
so what are your concerns when you are doing the cataract surgery for this patient? Now, if I see cataract, I will be happy, first of all, because uh, I could find something that explains his symptoms. Um, and definitely any degree of cataract should be removed, I, I think, because patients with advanced visual field appreciate very much the, the effect of cataract and they appreciate very much the effect of uh, cataract removal. They get much, much, um, you know, brightness in the visual field so that even if the visual acuity did not improve, the contrast will improve to a good extent to the patient. So uh, if the patient has cataract, I will go for, um, I, I will go for FACO uh, through a corneal incision, usually temporal, but uh, there might be a problem that um, the blood, I have to evaluate how the blood looks like because after quite long years, especially with mycomycin trubiculectomy, the blood might be leaking or something else that has to be dealt with at the time of cataract surgery. But if everything is fine, I have just given the patient a notice uh, that uh, there might be some pressure changes in the early post-operative because cataract surgery is known to have a deleterious effect on previous trabeculectomy, so that just in case the pressure might go up. And also, I will see my patients uh, very soon after the operation for fear of any uh, pressure spikes. I will try to make sure that all the viscoelastics are removed at the conclusion of the surgery. Uh, I will uh, push my patient to have um, uh, a monofocal intraocular lens. I will try to afford, avoid any kind of multifocality in a patient with already advanced visual field loss. Okay. And uh, as you have mentioned uh, before, that his blood pressure is very important. So what is your concern about the blood pressure? I think if you're having if you're having a patient who is deteriorating under a normal pressure, this is a big dilemma. So that uh, you need to make sure that if he is not is not having any drop of his blood pressure uh, during sleeping, which is known as the nocturnal dip of the uh, blood pressure. So that I will send that patient to an internist at the same same time to check the pressure to give me an idea about his nocturnal intraocular pressure and also to, to deal with the medications, if any, causing um, nocturnal hypotension. So that for this patient, I think we should be like a group dealing. And at the same time, uh, those patients need a kind of blood thinners uh, to enhance the blood flow so that I will ask if he's not receiving uh, a kind, at least aspirin, uh, to go for something like that. But definitely in collaboration with interns. Okay. And lastly, if all other concerns are fine, how will you manage? Do you think of glaucoma surgery? Do you think of neuroprotection or both? You know, this is interesting so that if we rolled out uh, the possibility of cataract, then uh, we need to think of, um, let us think of the, the more serious issue if the patient is having a glaucoma, which is uh, fluctuating and we are unaware of that so that uh, I would spend um, more time in getting the real um, intraocular pressure. And one of the indications of the surgical intervention, if the patient is having apparently normal intraocular pressure and is deteriorating, and that means that probably if you exclude that this patient is receiving the drops, he's, I, I mean he's adherent to therapy, then you need to think that the pressure is fluctuating at times which you don't see. We see the patients at only the office time, which is a bit restricted time, but some patients get uh, fluctuations more than 10 millimeter mercury, especially during sleeping. So that if I have a, a documented progression and the pressure is 12 and the, the patient had previous trap, then I have to go back to the question of Yasmin, what to do in this situation? Uh, shall we do another trap? Shall we go for a valve? Then uh, I need to evaluate the conjunctiva. Uh, and then there is a growing also indication that if you want to get some reduction of the intraocular pressure, you can use cycloablation like micropulse that can give you additional few millimeters that could be of great help to the patient without having to do a valve or uh, trap on a patient who is one eye. So I'll go more conservatively in the first place, but think of controlling glaucoma. For neuroprotection, I think this patient is a candidate for neuroprotection. 
And neuroprotection, uh, I go for uh, simpler options, like I ask the patient to walk for aerobic exercises. I like that very much. Even, um, you know, that to go in the, to walk as much as you can in his apartment. And then uh, I give uh, aspirin and I give Genco biloba. There are some reports about the efficacy of Genco biloba, uh, though you know that it has, um, you don't know for how long you're going to be to put the patients on that medication, but I actually give. And then uh, sometimes I give alpha agonist as well, especially for one eye patients. And um, I'm still afraid about those patients. I add uh, alpha agonist though they are having questionable efficacy, but I, I do prescribe them. Yes, I agree with you for the role of neuroprotection. Then we can conclude the keynotes of our discussion that measuring IOP at different times is essential to, uh, to uh, diagnose eye spikes. And we should always, in uh, this condition, exclude any confounding pathology like vascular accident, by carotid toppler or uh, compressive brain lesion by MRI. We should look for the lens, of course, and as you have said, we are glad if we have cataract. And uh, the blood pressure should be monitored very well to avoid nocturnal hypotension. And uh, in these conditions, we may uh, search for the neuroprotection effect, especially the Genco blob and other uh, measures. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you for all the audience. Thank you very much for this case, very interesting case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Zina. Thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing, uh, as usual, uh, presentation. Uh, now uh, we come to the end. So I cannot thank you enough. A great effort from uh, one of my colleagues have uh, just said that we are the dream team. And I believe I'm so lucky to work with the dream team, of course. Dr. Mm -hmm. Zina, thank you very much. Rasha. Uh, Yasmin, uh, Riham, Iman, Heba, uh, the uh, newcomers, uh, Mona and Fairuz, thank you very much. I think you have added great information to the let literature in this webinar, and uh, I appreciate uh, all what you have done. Thank you very, very much.